inflammation now i am asking you guys could you please tell me okay let me from now onwards i will be reading your comments because i have completed the first chapter now i am just in a hurry to complete the first chapter now let's begin with the inflammation sir the chapter number 2 the inflammation come on guys now i will be interactive from now onwards okay so tell me what exactly is inflammation okay what exactly is inflammation sir first of all see inflammation it ends with which word for example if i have, if i want to say there is inflammation in my heart okay right inflammation inflammation in my heart okay so inflammation of my heart so inflammation it ends with see it ends with which word itis okay anything which ends with itis is called as inflammation sir for example inflammation in my heart is called as carditis okay so inflammation in the heart is called as carditis then what is the inflammation in the pancreas is called as pancreatitis inflammation in the spinal cord is called as myelitis inflammation is in the ovaries is called as a oophritis so itis means what itis means inflammation so first of all why why inflammation so what exactly is inflammation inflammation why inflammation means it's a response of your tissues okay it's a response of your tissues okay for example i am teaching the class in a good way for example you will be having i will be having a good response from your side if i am not teaching in a good way i will be having uh, from from your side you will be giving a bad response or you are not teaching properly something kind of okay so there will be a response if there is something like the newton's uh, the third law right for every action there is equal and opposite reaction in the same way whenever you injure a tissue okay whenever you injure a tissue that tissue is going to give you the response that response is called as the inflammation okay okay now there is this one girl beautiful girl i just went to her and i just try to like you know just irritate her okay or for example imagine i am a very good guy i just try to deal with her in a very nice way so what how she is going to respond she is going to respond in a good way if i just try to misbehave with her how she is going to respond she is also going to give a weird look and she is going to definitely hit me right so in the same way our tissues also our tissues also when you injure them when you injure them they will also respond that response of the tissue is called as inflammation right response of injured tissues the response of the injured tissues is called as the inflammation okay now what are the cardinal signs now let's take the heading cardinal signs cardinal signs of inflammation now come on quickly so this should be high yielding this should not be like you know slow gradually thing no this should be high yielding this chapter should be high yielding okay very fastly we have to complete it and all the important topics we have to complete it so what are the cardinal signs of inflammation see imagine there is some tissue injury over here so whenever there is injury over here definitely this injured tissue will show the inflammation so what are the cardinal signs that you will see there are five cardinal signs sir in the area of inflammation you will see five cardinal signs what are they so these five cardinal signs are dala one dala kela tumor okay so ruba yes functional asia okay so what are they dollar calo tumor rubber functional asia now tell me what exactly is dollar sir in, the, in this area of inflammation here is the area of inflammation sir now this area you are going to have dollar what exactly is dollar mean dollar means pain okay what exactly is calo calo means increased temperature what is tumor from what tumor tumor means in the area of inflammation you are going to have swelling okay what is rubber in the area of inflammation you are going to have redness and what is functional asia now if wherever there is inflammation for example inflammation in my joints or inflammation in my muscles wherever there is inflammation definitely that organ function or that function the function of that particular tissue is going to be compromised so decrease activity decrease function decrease activity or decrease function of that particular tissue 
So these are the five cardinal signs of the inflammation. Okay. Whenever you are having inflammation, that tissue is going to show these five cardinal signs. Okay. Now out of these five cardinal signs, the first four cardinal signs is given by, do you know what the first four cardinal signs are given by a separate person and the fifth cardinal sign is given by separate person. So the first four cardinal signs are given by Celsius. And the fifth cardinal sign, functional asia is given by, who gave the functional asia? Rudolf, Virchow. Okay, Rudolf Virchow. Now, this guy, Rudolf Virchow is the father, sir. He's the father of, important points about the Rudolf Virchow, which we should know for our exams, is the father. Okay. He's the father of what? He's the father of modern pathology. He is the father of modal, modern pathology and not only that, he is also the father of, he, he is not, not the father, he is the one who coined the term cellular pathology. Okay, so Rudolf Virchow is the father of modern pathology. He gave the fifth cardinal sign, sir. He gave the fifth cardinal sign, that is the functional asia and the other cardinal signs, the dollar, calor, rubber, uh, the tumor were given by Celsius. Now, some important points which you should know for your exams regarding the Rudolf Virchow. Okay, sir, have you ever heard about Virchow triad? Virchow triad. Do you have any about uh, any idea about the Virchow triad? Sir, I'm, ge I'm getting a little deviated from the topic. A little deviated, sir, because this is very important. Okay, I should integrate this here itself. Now, Virchow triad. Virchow triad. See, Virchow triad includes endothelial injury. Okay, endothelial injury. Next, alteration in blood flow. Alteration in blood flow and hypercoagulability. Okay, hypercoagulability. So, what exactly is this Wirchow triad talking about? So, what this Wirchow triad, sir, what exactly is this? Sir, Wirchow triad is named after Rudolf Wirchow. The father of the modern pathology. So, in this Rudolf, um, in this Wirchow triad, the patient is going to have, uh, the person, see, uh, I, I should say something like that. If a patient is having any of this, okay, if the patient is having any of this, like endothelial injury or alterations in the blood flow, what is the normal blood flow? Normal blood flow is in like streamlined fashion, laminar fashion. It's a streamlined blood flow, sir. Our blood in the blood vessels is going in a very streamlined fashion. Alteration in the blood flow means stasis. Okay, sluggish flow of blood or turbulence. Okay, turbulent blood flow. So, in these conditions, in these uh, alterations like stasis and turbulent blood flow and hypercoagulable state, in hypercoagulable state, do you know what happens? So, this Wirchow triad is telling you when you will have thrombosis, when you will form the intravascular clots, okay, unnecessarily, why intravascular clots will be formed? This will be explained by the switch of triad. Okay. So, switch of triad includes endothelial injury, alterations in blood flow and hypercoagulable states. Now, in this particular condition, see this things happens in your body that will lead to thrombosis. Okay. These conditions can lead to thrombosis. You know, right? The deep venous thrombosis kind of. Okay. So, we are just... Trying to integrate the things, Rudolf, Rudolf Wirchow is the father of the modern pathology. He gave the term cellular pathology and Wirchow triad also completed. So, why we are discussing about all this? Because the functional asia, the last cardinal sign, the functional asia, uh, which is the decrease in activity and the decrease in function is given by our Rudolf Wirchow. Now, after this, what else you should know? There is something called as Wirchow node. Okay. Wirchow. Wirchow node. So, guys, can you tell me what exactly is Wirchow node? Wirchow node. So, Wirchow node is the left side supraclavicular. It's a left side supraclavicular lymph node. Okay. Which is affected. See, this left side supraclavicular lymph node, it will be affected in a condition, sir. See, that's a gastric carcinoma. Gastric means stomach cancer, sir. Gastric carcinoma. No ma. So this gastric carcinoma it metastasizes. Okay, this gastric carcinoma where it will metastasize? 
from the stomach this gastric carcinoma it will metastasize to the supraclavicular lymph node now the supraclavicular lymph node is called as a bridge of node okay so now tell me which of nodes are seen in which cancers the gastric carcinomas okay so uh, important points about the which of are enough enough rodolf which of uh, thank thank for him being the father of the modern pathology now let's come back to our topic inflammation sir okay so inflammation i gave you the definition it's a response of the tissues towards the injury five cardinal signs of inflammation i have discussed now types of inflammation tell me types of inflammation how many types two types they are what acute acute inflammation and chronic okay there are two types of inflammation acute inflammation and chronic inflammation okay yes one more acute inflammation and chronic inflammation so acute inflammation see there is nothing cute about it okay acute is not really cute sir so most of the students fail to understand what is the difference between acute and chronic inflammation okay so it's a little confusing sir but very simple acute inflammation means for example right now okay i just took a pin okay i just took a pin or i just took a, for example uh, some hot object fire imagine i just keep my finger in the fire sir finger in the fire so i am damaging my tissue or not yes i am going to damage my tissue so immediately within the next 1 minute 1 2 minutes immediately here inflammation will start so inflammation is going to start just like that sir just like that inflammation is starting so this type of inflammation is going to call as acute inflammation simple right if i just go and put my finger in the in the in the hot object on the fire immediately it's going to burn my tissues immediately inflammation is going to start fluid will start to accumulate over that area in, inflammation will start or do you think if i put my finger in the fire tomorrow inflammation will start no immediately it will start so acute inflammation starts rapidly okay so begins in short time okay it begins in short time and so today i had some burn injury or here small burn injury or here so what will happen it's going to heal right it's going to be there for one year no it's not going to be there for one year it's going to heal in in maybe maximum 3 4 days or one week maximum so ends quickly sir begins in a short time begins immediately and ends also quickly ends quickly okay so these are acute inflammations acute inflammation means begins quickly ends quickly that's it story is closed then what are chronic inflammation sir chronic inflammation means what imagine i am the person okay or imagine there is this one female who is suffering with rheumatoid arthritis so rheumatoid arthritis rheumatoid arthritis is going to be there for one single day one single day two single like you no know, two days for one week no rheumatoid arthritis means inflammation of the joints for continuous period of time for 10 years 20 years she is still suffering with the inflammation in the joints so inflammation that is prolonged long lived okay so if the inflammation is seen for long period of times then it is called as a chronic inflammation seen in chronic disorders seen in chronic disorders sir like right chronic inflammation seen in chronic diseases like autoimmune diseases okay autoimmune diseases like rheumatoid arthritis can be seen in conditions like sle okay or can be seen in conditions like cancers okay so these are the inflammatory conditions which are going to be seen for a long time okay so now complete it sir types of inflammation how many types acute inflammation chronic inflammation acute inflammation short time chronic inflammation long time now after this one more what else we have to know see acute inflammation right acute inflammation what is the difference between acute and chronic okay sir acute inflammation and chronic inflammation what are the differences one thing see if i am having acute inflammation right now i am having acute inflammation do you know what is the major cell what is the most important cell involved in this process mcq sir very important F fmg mcq as well as a pg mcq the cell which is involved in acute inflammation is neutrophil okay so neutrophils neutrophils are the cells mediate the acute inflammation then can you tell what is the most important cell in the chronic inflammation chronic inflammation long time the inflammation is continued by which cells macrophages 
So, macrophages are involved in chronic inflammation. Sir, now here are some exceptions. I will tell you one exception. So, normally in acute inflammation, neutrophils are involved, but this, this one acute inflammation which is called as typhoid. So, what is typhoid? Typhoid is also called as enteric fever. Okay, can you tell me this enteric fever is because of which organism? Typhoid or enteric fever is because of which organism? Salmonella typhi. Okay, now just tell me one thing. Typhoid, is it an acute problem or chronic problem? Is it going to be there for 6 months? No. The typhoid is very short lived thing, right? Maybe for 1 week or 10 days, that's it. Okay, it will be cured. If you use the tablets, it will be cured. Okay. So, here in this type of acute inflammation, Normally, neutrophil should be the prominent cells, dominant cells, but here, lymphocytes are going to be the dominant cells. In this acute inflammation, acute inflammation because of the salmonella, acute inflammation because of the salmonella, lymphocytes are going to be predominant. Lymphocytes are the prominent cells and that's your MCQ. And normally, in chronic inflammation, who is the pro predominant cell? It's the macrophage. But there is this one chronic inflammation, right? Chronic Pseudomonal infections. Pseudomonal infections. In chronic pseudomonal infections, see when the name chronic is there, chronic inflammations. In this chronic pseudomonal infections, what is our dominant cell? It is a neutrophil again. Neutrophil, not the macrophage, but the neutrophil. So this is the exception. These are the exceptions. Typhoid is one exception. That, that salmonella typhi. Salmonella in salmonella typhi infections, lymphocytes are going to be predominant. And in chronic pseudomonas infection, pseudomonas, don't forget, important points are there regarding pseudomonas. Can you tell me some important infections because of pseudomonas? Pseudomonas. You can answer that in the chat session. But pseudomonas is going to, pseudomonal infections is going to have dominant number of neutrophils, not the macrophages. Pseudomonas, important for your FMG exam as well as the NEET PG exam, okay, and board exams. See, pseudomonas is associated with burn wounds infection if i am having burns burns that burn wounds will be infected with pseudomonas okay pseudomonas uh, other important things are like zacuzzi syndrome hot tub folliculitis okay zacuzzi you know right the zacuzzi like you know that that those hot tubs where you will go and sit okay in the vacations so in that it will cause hot tub folliculitis so in that in those hot tubs this will be there okay pseudomonas will be there okay remember that now shall we begin with the Acute inflammation. Now, let's begin with the topic, sir. Acute inflammation. So, acute inflammation. Let's see the events. What are the events? Okay, what are the events seen in acute inflammation? Two events are there. Okay, there are two events. First events are vascular events. Vascular events. And the second events are cellular events. Okay, vascular events are there, cellular events are there, which means, imagine, there is some tissue injury, now the tissue got injured, now whenever there is a tissue injury, now here inflammation starts, acute inflammation, I am talking about acute inflammation, now acute inflammation starts, now in this acute inflammation, you know, there are two events, first, there are two events, two events will occur, okay, one by one, first, vascular events will occur, some vascular changes will occur, sir, some vascular changes will occur, followed by Cellular events, vascular events followed by cellular events. Now, let's begin our topic with vascular events. Okay, what are the vascular events that seen in the acute inflammation? Okay, vascular events, what are those vascular events? Now, first vascular event is, whenever there is some damage, for example, imagine uh, you just get a blade and you just make a cut over here. Okay, just give me a cut. Now, tissues are getting damaged, no doubt. Tissues are getting injured. Now, do you know what is the first thing that will happen in inflammation? What is the first vascular event that will happen is vasoconstriction, sir. So, the first blood vessels will undergo vasoconstriction. Just for a second, they will undergo vasoconstriction, sir. This is a transient thing. This is a transient response because of the neurogenic reflex, because of the neurogenic reflex, first to prevent the blood loss, first to prevent the blood loss, immediately the blood vessels will undergo constriction. So, first event, the first vascular event is vasoconstriction. Okay. 
and it is a transient it's like a transient thing okay now second event is vaso dilation okay vaso dilation now why vaso dilation sir imagine there is an injury okay there is some in, uh, some infection going on or some injury happens sir here now what happened to the blood vessel surrounding this area the blood vessel surrounding this area will start to undergo vaso dilation why vaso dilation to bring the more blood to bring the more plasma so that more glucose will come more neutrophils will come more rbc will come okay so more neutrophils more macrophages more complement proteins will come so that if there is any bacteria in this area if the bacteria is causing this injury the bacteria will be killed okay so first vasodilation is a first vasoconstriction occurred followed by vasodilation vasodilation brings more blood flow to that area okay more blood flow is coming to that area okay so vasodilation okay some important points about the vasodilation here itself vasodilation what it is doing it increases the blood flow okay now because of this vasodilation tell me more blood is coming to that area right into the area of inflammation so if more blood is coming to that area how that area will look sir rubber okay so vasodilation is the one responsible for redness rubber again if more blood is coming to this area more blood is coming to this area so what happened to the local temperature in this area more warm blood is coming okay so cause a scalar scalar means what increase temperature so mcq ask in the exam is rubber and calor are because of rubber and calor are they because of vasoconstriction vasodilation increased vascular permeability or stasis they will give you so rubber and calor they are because of the vasodilation vasodilation is it good or bad vasodilation is good it's bringing more blood more wbc are coming more neutrophils more macrophages more neutrophils are are coming so that if there is any bacteria that bacteria will be killed okay next sir Uh, next what what else they can ask you in your exam is what are the mediators what are the mediators that are causing this vasodilation this vasodilation is mainly because of what okay so this vasodilation someone should mediate right so, sir here there is tissue injury here the tissue is injured now from this injured area okay from this injured area some mediators are released sir so some chemical mediators are released those chemical mediators are causing the vasodilation so who are those mediators now mediators is histamine mcq sir histamine is produced by which cells sir histamine is released from sir histamine m i n e this is histamine histamine is released from which cells mast cells sir mcq histamine is released from mast cells okay so histamine is causing the vasodilation because of vasodilation more blood flow because of more blood flow there is rubber and calor rubber and calor next third the vaso constriction completed vaso dilation also completed after that what after that what okay so after that there is increased vascular permeability okay increased vascular permeability sir so what is increased vascular permeability vaso dilation increases the blood flow okay now try to understand like this imagine this is your blood vessel okay now this is your blood vessel so these are the this is the tissue this is the tissue where inflammation is going on okay this is the tissue where inflammation is going on now do you know what happens now see the plasma now from this blood vessel it will start to leak now this plasma <laughs> plasma now it will start to leak into the tissue sir so now the blood vessels become more leaky now the blood vessels become more permeable for the plasma to enter into the tissues that's something good more plasma is coming more complement proteins will come so this complement activation can actually kill the bacteria if there is any bacteria in that inflamed area that will be killed okay so increased vascular permeability is the third vascular event third vascular event but the hallmark the hallmark of the acute inflammation is increase vascular permeability right so this increase vascular permeability mcq is a hallmark hallmark of acute inflammation okay it is a hallmark of acute inflammation now my question to you is sir what are the mechanisms how actually this increase permeability works 
Why exactly more plasma is coming into the tissues? How sir? How exactly is? Let me write here the mechanisms. The mechanisms of increased vascular permeability. Okay, the mechanisms of increased vascular permeability. Deco, uh, before telling you the mechanisms, I just want to add one more point here. See, rubber and collar are because of what? Can you tell me? So, this rubber and collar, are they because of vasoconstriction or vasodilation? They are because of the vaso dilation more blood is coming now what i explained to you sir because of the increased vascular permeability more fluid more plasma is coming into the inflamed area so when more plasma is leaking into the tissues that tissue will become swollen so because of this increase in vascular permeability what which cardinal sign is seen it is the tumor sir so tumor so tumor is due to increased vascular permeability Okay, sir. Now, what are the mechanisms? Why? Why vascular permeability, sir? How vascular permeability? Not why. How vascular permeability is first thing is endothelial cell contraction. Okay. Endothelial cell contraction. Okay, endothelial cell contraction. So, first let me explain to you what exactly is the endothelial cell contraction. Okay. Now, imagine this is your blood vessel. Okay. Normally, blood vessel is lined by which cells? Endothelial cells. Endothelial cells. Okay. Now, what is happening is, they go, normally, this is how the endothelial cells are. For example, see, these are the endothelial cells. Normal, normal endothelial cells. Now, in this inflammation, what happens is, because of certain mediators, because of certain mediators which are coming from the inflamed area, because of these mediators, now, see, they go, what is happening to the endothelial cells? So, the endothelial cells are contracting. The endothelial cells are getting contracted. When the endothelial cells are getting contracted, what happened to the space now? So, now there is this extra space, sir. Now, through these gaps, through these gaps, now fluid is getting, entering into the shoe. Okay. Now, the endothelial cell contraction is the most common mechanism. Okay. This is the most common mechanism of increased vascular permeability. Where the endothelial cells are getting contracted, creating the gaps through which the plasma is leaking into the tissue, inflamed area. This is one thing. Next, what are the mediators? Mediators for this endothelial cell contraction. Why the endothelial cells are getting contracted, sir? What are the mediators? The mediators, sir, let me write here. Mediators in this is histamine again. Histamine and serotonin. Okay. So, because of this histamine and serotonin, the endothelial cells will undergo contraction. Okay. Next. So, this is one mechanism number one, endothelial cell contraction. First mechanism is this. Second mechanism is leukocyte. Leukocyte. Mediator. Leukocyte mediated injury. Okay. So, direct leukocyte mediated injury cell. Okay, sorry, uh, leukocyte mediated injury. So, what exactly is this leukocyte mediated injury? Okay, now look here. The third one I am explaining here. See, they go in this uh, image. So, this is your blood vessel. Okay, this is your blood vessel. And here is your tissue, inflamed tissue. Okay, this is the inflamed tissue, sir. Now, what happens is whenever there is inflammation, okay, whenever there is inflammation, more blood is coming, vasodilation, more blood is coming, more neutrophils are coming. See, now, these are your endothelial cells. Imagine these are your endothelial cells. Now, neutrophils are coming to this area. Okay, these are the neutrophils. Okay, this is the neutrophil. Imagine this is your the neutrophil. Now, this neutrophil, what it will do is, now in this inflammatory condition, now this neutrophil, it will release a lot of cytokines. Okay, now directly, this neutrophils can lead to damage of this endothelial cells. Okay, these endothelial cells, might be damaged because of the neutrophils. When this endothelial cells are damaged, what happens? See, now they go, this endothelial cell is getting damaged because of a neutrophil. Okay. Now, what happens? See, here the endothelial, dam the endothelial cell is damaged. Now, when the endothelial cell is damaged, what happens? Now, the fluid through that space, the plasma can leak into the tissue. So, this is called as leukocyte mediated injury. Okay. And third mechanism of increased vascular permeability. Sir, can you tell me any other reason? why more uh, fluid is going into the tissues. One example I gave you, endothelial cell contraction, most common. Leukocyte mediated uh, injury. Next thing is, 
see whenever there is injury over here whenever there is some trauma okay so there is some trauma not only tissue is damaged but endothelial cells are also damaged right endothelial cells blood vessels blood vessels and endothelial cells inside the blood vessels can they can be directly damaged so that is called as a direct endothelial injury okay so direct damage to direct damage to endothelial cells so now tell me what are the reasons for increased vascular permeability the reasons for the increased vascular permeability is first one endothelial cell contraction leukocyte mediated injury to the endothelial cells third one is a direct damage to the endothelial cells direct damage because of the trauma some endothelial cells are damaged so blood vessels become more leaky okay more fluid is now coming to the tissues now fourth reason is the transcytosis Okay, now reason number four is transcytosis. Now, what exactly is transcytosis? Now, let me explain here itself. Now, imagine this is the blood vessel. Now, what are these? These are the endothelial cells. Okay, now imagine I am just showing you the intact endothelial cells. There is no damage to the endothelial cells. And I haven't even shown the endothelial cell contractions. Okay. Now, here what is this? This is the tissue which is getting inflamed. Okay. This is the tissue cell. Imagine this is tissue. Now, what happens is, in the state of inflammation, there are certain mediators that are produced. Okay, there are certain mediators that are produced. I will tell you what is that mediator. Now, these mediators will start to act on this endothelial cells. During inflammation, from the damaged area, from the inflamed area, these, these mediators are getting produced. These mediators, they will act on the endothelial cells so now endothelial cells what they are doing is they are going to make this organelle this organelle is called as the this uh, vaculo vesicular vacular organelle okay so this organelle vv organelle vesiculo vacular organelle so through this organelle okay through this organelle what happens now fluid is directly transcytosis means what trans means through the cells through directly through the cells okay so directly through the cells now the fluid is going into the tissue okay so now what are the mediators so this is the vesicular vascular organelle i explained you so which mediators will help in production of this vesicular vascular organelle and helps in transcytosis is vascular endothelial growth factor so vascular endothelial growth factor whatever is produced Okay, vascular VEGF, vascular endothelial growth factor that's produced. What it's going to do? It's going to help in transcytosis. Transcytosis means through the cell, the fluid is going to enter the tissues. So, these are some mechanisms of increased vascular permeability. This is the most important topic. Increased vascular permeability is the most important topic. So, now tell me what happened? Whenever there is some injury happening in the tissue, first vascular events will occur. What is the first vascular event? Vasoconstriction. What is the second vascular event? Vasodilation. What is the third vascular event? Increased vascular permeability, increased vascular leakage. Leakage, the blood vessels are become leaky. Now, what are the mechanisms of this increased vascular permeability? One is endothelial cell contraction, leukocyte mediated damage to the endothelial cells, or direct damage to the endothelial cells, or transcytosis, the fluid shift, the fluid movement through this vascular vascular organelle because of this vascular endothelial growth factor okay this vascular endothelial growth factor it acts it acts on the endothelial cells so transcytosis will occur four mechanisms i said you okay and one more mechanism is there fifth mechanism final mechanism that is angiogenesis okay angiogenesis sir so what exactly is this angiogenesis angio angio means blood vessel genesis means newly produced okay newly the blood vessels are getting produced now try to understand imagine there is this area of inflammation sir here inflammation inflammation is going on okay this is the area of inflammation now do you know what happens from this damaged area just now i explained you from this damaged area vascular endothelial growth factor is released okay vascular who is producing this vascular endothelial growth factor we will discuss about that later we will discuss about that later but from the damaged area this vascular endothelial growth factor is getting released now this vascular endothelial growth factor, do you know what it will do? It will help in the angiogenesis. 
Now, because of this vascular endothelial growth factor, new blood vessels, new blood vessels will start to come to this area. Okay, new blood vessels will start to come to this area, sir. Now, tell me, new blood vessels are immature blood vessels. They are not tight. Okay, so they are immature blood vessels, sir. Between the endothelial cells, proper tight junctions are not there. Now, these blood vessels are very immature. They are leaky. Okay. So, because of this angiogenesis, immature blood vessels are forming. These immature blood vessels are more leaky blood vessels, sir. They do not have tight connections between the cell. They are more leaky. So, that more and more fluid is coming into the tissues because of the angiogenesis. And your exam MCQ is, the angiogenesis is because of which mediator? Vascular endothelial growth factor. Okay. So, with this, done, sir. With this, done. The increased vascular permeability is completed. What are the mechanisms? Endothelial cell contraction, leukocyte mediated damage, direct damage to the endothelial cells and transcytosis as well as angiogenesis. Angiogenesis. Okay. So, these are the vascular events. Three vascular events are completed. So, what is the first vascular event? Vasoconstriction. That is transient. Vasodilation, increased vascular permeability. Now, the last vascular event which I want you to know here is, right? The last vascular event, the fourth vascular event the big one is anyone, any idea? Stasis. So, stasis will occur, sir. Stasis. What is stasis? Slow blood flow. Blood is going slowly. Okay, blood is going slowly. Why blood is going slowly? Now, try to understand like this. This is the blood vessel. Okay. Now, what is this? This is the area of the tissue which is getting inflamed. This is the tissue which is getting inflamed. This is a sad thing. Okay, it's a sad tissue. It's getting inflamed, sir. Okay. Now, what I said you? Sir, the endothelial cell contraction. Endothelial cells will contract. Okay, endothelial cells will contract. Now, fluid is going to shift into the tissues. Fluid is shift, shift, shifting, shifting into the tissues. See, when you are removing the fluid, okay, when you are moving the fluid out of the blood vessels, see, the fluid is coming out. So, what happened to the blood now? The blood is becoming thicker, right? The viscosity of the blood increases. The concentration of the blood increases. So, now, do you think blood will move fast? No. The fluid is shifting, so the movement of the blood, so the blood is getting concentrated, okay? So the blood is getting concentrated, sir, okay? So, concentration increases. Why? Why? Because there is shift of the fluid. The fluid is getting shifted. Now, the blood is getting concentrated, so this concentrated blood, now it will go slowly through the tissue, slowly through the tissue. Why? This is good, sir. This is good. Because when the velocity of the blood decreases, now, from the blood, cells, neutrophils, macrophages, they get enough time, they get enough time to leak into the tissues. They will also come into the tissues, sir. The blood is going slowly. As the blood is going slowly, now it is easy for the macrophages and neutrophils to come into the tissue. So, that's the last vascular event. So, come on guys, tell me how many vascular events we have discussed. We have discussed four vascular events. Okay, four vascular events. What are they? One is vasoconstriction. The second thing is vasodilation. Vasoconstriction, vasodilation, increased vascular permeability and its mechanisms and the last vascular event is stasis. Okay, with the stasis, vascular events are completed, sir. First vascular events completed. Now, what will happen now? Cellular events. So, vessel changes are completed. Vessel changes, when the tissue is damaged, now what are the vessel changes that will happen? Discussed. Done. Now, let's take the heading. The next thing, half of the thing is completed, sir. Now, from here it is easy. Cellular events. Cellular events. Okay. So, what are the cellular events? Sir, which cells? First of all, you are saying, sir, cellular events. Which cells? Neutrophils, macrophages. So, these phagocytic cells. Okay. Now, do you know what happened during the inflammation? Now, let me show, sir. First event, number one, first event is called as margination. So, what the hell is this margination, sir? Margination means, Deko, now this is the blood vessel. Okay, this is the blood vessel. Fun mode, this is the blood vessel. Okay, Pankaj, fun mode. Okay, this is the blood vessel, sir. Now, what is this? This is the area of inflammation. Okay, this is the inflamed tissue. Now, Deko, margination means normally, see, in our blood vessel, in our blood vessel, blood is going in very laminar fashion or streamlined fashion. Blood is going in streamlined fashion. In the center of the blood vessel, what are these cells? These are your RBCs. Surrounding the RBCs, what are there? Sir, WBCs are there. Okay, WBCs are surrounding the RBC. Now, what we need to do? Sir, here is the area of inflammation. Now, this 
WBC, that is a neutrophil, it have to come towards the wall, it have to move towards the endothelial cells. First, it have to move towards the endothelial cells so that now it can enter into the tissues. First event is, sir, this WBCs need to come to the margins of the blood vessels. Okay, they are in the central column, they are going in the central column. Now, these cells need to be marginated. So, this is called as margination. Okay, so margination means what? The movement of the WBC, the movement of the WBC towards the margin, towards the blood vessel wall. This is called as margin, to, yeah, towards the periphery, exactly, towards the periphery. Okay, that's called as a margination, sir. Okay, now after margination, okay, after margination, what is the second cellular event? Okay, it came to the margin, sir. The second cellular event is called as rolling. So, what exactly is this rolling? Rolling means, I will tell you, say, with an example, I will tell you, Deco, now, again, this is the blood vessel. Okay, this is the blood vessel. Right? So, these blood vessels are lined by what? So, these blood vessels, they are lined by this endothelial cells. Okay, I am showing the endothelial cells with contraction. Endothelial cells are contracted. Okay, clearly I am showing the gaps also. Now, this is the area of the tissue. Okay, now let's take this is the area of the tissue, sir, where inflammation is going on. Okay, now here, so what are these? See, for example, okay, what is this? This is not the sperm. This is the bacteria. Okay, this is the bacteria, sir. Okay, bacteria is there. It's causing, so this bad guy is there. Okay, he's causing the inflammation. Okay, maybe the inflammation in this case, maybe because of bacteria or some because of autoimmune disease or because of, uh, because of some uh, immunological, Im because of immunological thing or because of radiation or because of microbiological issue. So, inflammation is there. Now, inflammation just now started, just now started. Okay, now, what should happen, sir? The WBC, it's now marginated. The WBC is now marginated. Now, WBCs are going with a very high speed, sir. Very high speed. The WBCs are going with very high speed. So, now what we need to do? First, we need to decrease the speed of the WBCs. Okay. So, do you know what happens now? Sir, on this endothelial cells, they go. On this endothelial cells, there are these molecules present. Okay. There are these molecules present. So, these molecules, which I am showing you here, these are called as selectins. Okay. These are like speed breakers, sir. These are like speed breakers. Now, what happens is, this WBC, it is going to bind with them. WBC, on the surface of WBC, there is a receptor. That red color thing which I am showing you. So, this red color thing is called as silyl Lewis X. It's, a, it's called as a silyl Lewis X. On that, see, on this neutrophil I am talking about, this is a neutrophil. Okay. Sir, on this neutrophil, there is silyl Lewis X present. Now, what is this violet color thing? Sir, this violet color thing, they are selectins. Okay, these are the selectins. So, selectins are going to bind with the silyl Lewis X. Selectins are binding with the silyl Lewis X. Okay, so that what happens? Now, just they bind and immediately it will detach, sir. Immediately it will detach. This is not a strong bond. It's not a strong bond. So, neutrophil is coming, binding and again detaching. Again going to bind with the other selectins. Okay, so what is happening? So, we are actually trying to slow down the WBCs which are going through that area. We are slowing down. Okay, we are slowing them down. So, how we are actually slowing them down? Because, how, how means? With the help of the selectin molecule. Selectins will bind with the silyl Lewis X. This helps in rolling of the cells. Rolling. Okay, WBC, it is now slowly rolling. We have decreased the split. Okay. Now, MCQs which will come in your exam is, how many types of selectins are there? There are different types of selectins. P selectin, the P selectin, E selectin, L selectin, Okay, platelet selectin, endothelial selectin, okay, L type means leukocyte selectin. There are different types of selectin. What they will ask in your exam is, sir, what is the CD marker? Cluster designation, CD marker of the selectins. CD 62. Okay, CD 62, guys. Don't forget, this is MCQ. The CD marker of selectins is CD 62. So now what happened? Cells first marginated. Now they are rolling, sir. Now they are slowly rolling. Their speed decreasing. Okay, now the third event is selectins CD marker is CD62. Okay, CD62. Okay, now after rolling, next event. Okay, after rolling, the next event is adhesion. Okay, so the next event is adhesion, sir. So, what exactly is happening in this adhesion? The name itself is there. Adhesion means tightly bonding. Okay, previously it is just rolling. Rolling means not tight bond. 
Silyl Lewis X binds with selectin again detachment. Silyl Lewis X binds with uh, selectin again detachment. So it's attachment, detachment, attachment, detachment. But now strong bond, sir. Now strong bond is going to form between the neutrophil and endothelial cells. Now let me show you that. So imagine this is your blood vessel. Okay. This is your blood vessel. Here is the area of the inflamed tissue. Okay, inflamed tissue. Now, they go, these are the endothelial cells. Now, what happens is, look, this is your neutrophil. Okay, this is your neutrophil. Now here, these are different molecules. Now these are the different molecules. Now, what is this molecule which I am drawing here? This is <coughs> VCAM. The green color one which I have drawn here, it is called as VCAM. This green color one is called as V. Cam. Okay, so VCAM is present where? On the endothelium. VCAM is present on VCAM for vascular cell adhesion molecule. VCAM. And let me show you with other color, pink color. What is this one? This is called as ICAM. ICAM. So intercellular, <coughs> intercellular cell adhesion molecule. Okay, intercellular cell adhesion molecule. VCAM is there, ICAM is there. Okay, now who is going to bind with them? Sir, on the neutrophil, they go on the neutrophil. Let me put the neutrophil a little above. So let me shift this neutrophil. Okay. So on the surface of the neutrophil, they go. There are other molecules. There are these other molecules. Do you know what are they? Okay. V cam, I cam are present on the endothelium. They go. V cam, I cam are present on the endothelium. Now, who is present on the neutrophil? Previously, we have discussed about the silyl Lewis X. Okay, silyl Lewis X is going to bind with the selectives. Now, right now, this is not rolling. This is tight bondage, adhesion. So, which molecules are going to help in the adhesion? See, now, this black color molecules, do you know anyone? Beta 1, beta 2, integrins. So, this are, these black color molecules are integrins. Okay, so this is beta 1 integrin. Okay, beta 1 integrin. This is beta 2 integrin. So, integrins are present where? Sir, integrins are present on the neutrophils. Integrins are present on the neutrophils. Sir, VCAM, ICAM, cell adhesion molecules are present on the endothelial cells. Now, they will strongly bind, sir. Now, they will strongly bind like this. This is a strong bond. Now, there is no more rolling, no more detachment. They are now totally blocked. Blocked. Now, here I want to add important MCQs for your exam. Important MCQ, sir. Let me draw the same thing with little additional points, little additional points, okay. Deco, this is your blood vessel. What is happening during adhesion? You know it. Sir, what is this? This is one endothelial cell I am showing. This is the endothelial cell. Sir, on the endothelial cell, which molecules are present? Sir, on the endothelial cell, see this is VCAM. Imagine this is the VCAM. Okay, let me show you the green color, same colors. Let me use the same colors. This is VCAM. Yeah, this is the VCAM molecule, VCAM, vascular cell adhesion molecule and the other one is pink, pink in color. So this is ICAM, okay, this is ICAM, intercellular cell adhesion molecule, okay. Now they are going to bind with what? They are going to bind with which cell? See, here is the neutrophil. Now let me show you the neutrophil here. Let me show you the red color. Now let's imagine this is the neutrophil. Okay, this is the neutrophil, sir. The neutrophil with multilobated nucleus. Okay, imagine this is your neutrophil. Now, sir, you know, this is the beta integrin, right? Here I have explained you previously. This is the beta 1 integrin. Let's take, imagine. Here, this is the beta 1 integrin. So, which beta 1 integrin, sir? Exactly. Which beta 1 integrin? This beta 1 integrin is VLA4, very light antigen 4, sir. Okay, VLA4, very light antigen 4. See, this very light antigen 4, this one, this black color thing, this very light antigen 4, it is nothing but a beta 1 integrin. So, VLA4 is binding with what? Sir, VLA4, V for V, okay, V for V, VLA4, very light antigen 4, which is a beta 1 integrin, it is going to bind with vascular cell adhesion molecule. 
okay mcq vla4 is beta 1 integrin next also i have shown one more integrin so what is this integrin beta 2 integrin right this is a beta 2 integrin okay beta 2 integrin can you give me any examples of this beta 2 integrin sir beta 2 integrin example sir lfa okay LFA, what exactly is LFA? You, you no need to know, know about that. Leukocyte functional antigen, no need to know about that. LFA and MAC. Okay, LFA and MAC. So, what exactly are this LFA and MAC? Simple guys. LFA and MAC molecules, they are nothing but beta 2 integrins. What is an example of beta 1 integrin? The beta 1 integrin is VLA4, very light antigen 4. It is beta 1 integrin. So, beta 1 integrins are going to bind with the VCAMs. Beta 2 integrins, that is the LFA and MAC, they are going to bind with the ICAMs. So, adhesion completed, strongly bound, adhesion completed, sir. Now, after adhesion, what is the next cellular event? Margination completed, rolling completed and adhesion. Rolling, which molecules are helping you? Sir, which molecules are helping you in the rolling? Selectins, right, with the big letter, selectins. Okay, selectin molecules. And which molecules are helping adhesion? Integrins. Okay, integrins and VCAM, ICAM. Okay, VCAM and ICAM, sir. Okay. Next. Next, after this, after this, what is the next cellular event? Can you tell me? Fourth cellular event after adhesion, sir. Now, see, this neutrophil, where it have to come? We just don't want adhesion. This neutrophil have to come into the area of inflammation. It have to come into the area of inflammation. If there is any bacteria, it have to kill the bacteria. It have to kill the bacteria. So, now the next step, the next step is, any idea? It's called as a transmigration, right? This is the question which was asked in the FMG exams and need PG exams also. Transmigration, which is also called as diabetes. Okay, which is also called as diabetes. Okay, diabetes. So, transmigration or diabetes. Sir, what exactly is this transmigration or diabetes? Transmigration. Who is migrating? Trans means through the blood vessels. Migration. Who is migrating, sir? Now, MCQ. They go very important MCQ. Again, this is the blood vessel. Okay, here is a blood vessel. Now, you know what is this one? Sir, these are the endothelial cells. Okay, these are the endothelial cells. Okay, good. Now, this is the area of inflamed tissue. This is the area of inflamed tissue, sir. Okay. Now, neutrophil have to come to this inflamed tissue, inflamed area. This is the area of inflammation. Now, Deco, what is happening is, sir, here, the neutrophil is totally adhesive, sir. Adhesion completed. Okay, adhesion completed. Now, this neutrophil, what it have to do? Sir, this neutrophil, it have to actually pass through this gap. Okay, the neutrophil have to actually pass between the endothelial cells. In between the endothelial cells, it have to transmigrate. So, this is the endothelial cell. Okay, this is, the, this is our endothelial cell, which is, what is doing? It's transmigrating. This is called as a diabetes. Now, one MCQ. Okay, one important MCQ is there here. Which molecule is helping in this diabetes? Selectin, integrin, cell adhesion molecule. Which molecule is helping in this diabetes? Any idea? Which molecule is helping in this diabetes? This molecule is called as PCAM. Okay. Let me write. Yeah. So, the molecule which is helping, which is present on the endothelial cells as well as on the uh, neutrophils, this molecule is called as PECAM. Okay. PECAM, sir. Okay. PECAM, which is also called as CD. 31 MCQ. This is the MCQ. PCAM or CD31 is the molecule which is going to help you in transmigration. Okay, done. Transmigration also completed. Now, after transmigration, what should happen? After transmigration, sir, now where is our neutrophil? Now, neutrophil came into the tissue. Now, neutrophil, it came out of the blood vessel. First, it came out of the blood vessel. Now, here is a neutrophil, sir. It came out. Okay, neutrophil came out of the blood vessel. Okay, this is our neutrophil which came out. Now, see, here, the next event I am telling you, actually this is not a cellular event, this is not a cellular event, but I would like to tell you here itself, okay. Now, Deco, sir, here, 
in this inflamed area, maybe in this condition, in this condition, this inflammation, this injury, this damage is because of microbiological insult, because of some bacteria, some bacteria is causing inflammation, sir, now here. Now, what we need to do with the bacteria? We have to kill the bacteria. Okay, we have to do what? We have to kill the bacteria. So, how can we kill the bacteria? By garnishing this bacteria. You need to garnish this bacteria. You need, you need to make it beautiful. So that immediately the macrophage or the neutrophil will recognize it and it eat and it will eat it. Okay. So the next event I am discussing here is called as is called as opsonization. Okay. Yeah, I will come to the chemotaxis. I will come to the chemotaxis. But before chemotaxis itself, I am telling you one small event. Okay. So that is opsonization. So what is opsonization? Opsonization means you need to know because if this is the bacteria. Okay, this is the bacteria, sir. Okay, bad guy. Now, what we need to do? We need to decorate this bacteria with the help of certain molecules. Those molecules are called as opsonins. Okay, so opsonins, what are those molecules which will help in, uh, like, you know, fast uh, killing of this bacteria? Okay, so those molecules are, right? So, what are the opsonins? Opsonins are C3, B, C3B, and FC portion, okay, FC portion of IgG antibody, okay, FC portion of IgG antibody, okay. So, these are, sir, this is C3B, okay, complement protein C3B, okay, C3B and Ig. So, C3B is the decorating molecule, so making, making the bacteria more delicious, more delicious for what? For phagocytosis. Okay, so just this one point remember. Now, let's come back to our topic. Transmigration completed, sir. Transmigration. The WBC came into the tissues. The uh, WBC came out of the blood vessel. Now, what should happen? Sir, this WBC, it have to go. This WBC, it have to go. Or the neutrophil have to go to the area of inflammation. It have to go to the area of inflammation. So, now, draw this. This stage is called as chemotaxis. The fifth event is called as chemo. Axis. What are the first four events which we have completed? First four events are migration, rolling, adhesion, transmigration and now chemotaxis. What exactly is chemotaxis? Right? This is a blood vessel. Neutrophil came out of the blood vessel. Okay? Neutrophil, it came out of the blood vessel, sir. Now, what it have to go? Where it have to go? See, this is the area of inflammation. Okay? This is the area of inflammation. Now, it have to come to the area of inflammation. Directly, it have to come to the area of inflammation. And what it have to do? It have to attack the bacteria. It have to attack the bacteria, sir. Bacteria is already ready. It is ready, garnished. Garnished with what? C3B and FC portion of IgG antibody. FC3, FC portion of the IgG antibody, C3B and even molecules like fibrinogen. Even molecules like fibrinogen acts as up absorins. Okay, acts as absorins. Now, this movement. My question to you. This movement, the movement of this neutrophil, directly to the area of inflammation. It's a unidirectional movement. See, it's not a multidirectional movement. It's a one single. It's a unidirectional movement, sir. This unidirectional movement is called as chemotaxis. Unidirectional, sir. It's a unidirectional. Okay, they will ask you. Chemotaxis is unidirectional or multidirectional? It's a one single. Directly it will come. The neutrophil won't go here and there. Neutrophil will directly come to the area of inflammation. Why? Sir, how this neutrophil, the neutrophil is not having eyes, right? Then how it will know where it should go? Sir, how it will know that where it should go? Where it, it will directly come to the area of inflammation. How, sir? Because from this area, from this inflamed area, okay, from the area of inflammation, certain chemicals are released. Certain chemotactic agents are released. So, now this neutrophil will sniff. The neutrophil is going to sniff these chemicals and directly will go into the area of inflammation. So, what are these chemical mediators? These chemical mediators are called as chemotactic agents. Okay, let me write here what are the chemotactic agents? Chemotactic agents. So, what are these chemotactic agents? Previously, I have written, right? The leukotriene B4, interleukin 8, okay, and C5A. So, these are the chemotactic agents. See, these chemicals, these chemicals, are produced from the area of inflammation so that neutrophil will identify from wherever from where these chemicals are coming okay so neutrophil 
or macrophages will go to that particular area. So, chemotaxis also completed. Now, just tell me important points about the chemotaxis. Chemotaxis is the movement of the neutrophil to the area of inflammation. Chemotaxis is unidirectional or multidirectional? It's a unidirectional. Which chemicals helps in this chemotaxis? What are the chemotactic agents? The chemotactic agents are leukotriene B4, interleukin 8 and C5A. The chemotaxis also completed, sir. Okay, cellular event, chemotaxis also completed. So, what, are com what we have completed with cellular events? Margination completed, rolling, adhesion, transmigration and chemotaxis. Okay, chemotaxis also completed. Now, last one is what? Last one is what? Okay, see, Deco, the last one is phagocytosis. Phagocytosis, the last event is phagocytosis. So, what exactly is phagocytosis? Now, so guys, this is the area of inflammation. Now, for example, see, this is the area of inflammation, sir. Okay. Imagine this is the area of inflammation. Now, here is the bacteria. Imagine, sir, this is the bacteria. Okay, there is this bacteria present here. Oh, no, why like that? Now, let's see. This is the bacteria, sir, bad guy. Okay. Here he is, bad guy. Now, our neutrophil also came here. Okay, now our neutrophil also came here. Now, here they go. This is our neutrophil. Many neutrophils, many, many neutrophils will come into this area, sir. Okay, neutrophil via the chemotactic agents, uh, via the, via the, via the chemo, uh, chemotaxis, it came into the area of inflammation. Now, do you know what this neutrophil will do? Or this macrophage, whatever came it will do? Sir, now they go. Sir, now this neutrophil, it is extending its cell membrane. Okay, this is one neutrophil, sir. Okay, this is our neutrophil. What it is doing? It is extending its cell membrane, so it's forming this arm-like structure. These are called as the pseudopods. Okay, these are the pseudopods. By forming its pseudopods, now it is doing what? It is engulfing. It is engulfing the bacteria. Okay, it's taking the bacteria. Okay, so these are the pseudopods. Pseudopods. So with the help of the pseudopods, it will engulf the bacteria. It will take the bacteria into the cell. So now, I should show you something like this. Imagine this is the neutrophil. Inside the neutrophil, you got a vesicle, you formed a vesicle, you have taken this vesicle into the cell. Now, in the vesicle, who is there? This poor bacteria is there, see, Deco. This is the poor bacteria, which is now crying because it's going to be killed, sir. It's crying, okay? So, now this vesicle is called as, now the bacteria is taken into the neutrophil. Now, this vesicle is called as phagosome. Phagosome, sir, okay? Now, the phagosome came into the cell. Now, what will happen, do you know? Now, what will happen? So, we have to kill this bacteria. How can we kill this bacteria? Guys, do you know how can we kill this bacteria? One mold, rainy, one mold, rain. Do you know how we can kill this bacteria? Sir, inside this neutrophils and macrophages, inside our WBC, what do we have? We have something special. Sir, what is this, sir? This is lysosome. There is lysosome, sir. Okay, there is lysosome. What we have to do? We have to fuse this lysosome and phagosome. Okay. So, do you know what happens now? They go. The next event is, sir, this is your WBC, neutrophil or the macrophage. Now, inside, what is this? Sir, this is the, they go. Look at here. So, this is your phagosome. Inside the phagosome, who is there? Bacteria is there. This is the bacteria. Okay. This is the bacteria. Okay, now this phagosome, it's going to be fused with what? It is going to be fused with the lysosome. Okay, both the phagosome and lysosome, they are going to be fused, forming what? Phagolysosome. Okay, now this is phagolysosome. Now, what happens? Now, the hydrolytic enzymes, whatever were there, okay, now the hydrolytic enzymes, whatever were there in the lysosome, okay, the hydrolytic enzymes, okay, whatever were there in the lysosomes, they will be releasing onto the bacteria. Now, tell me what happens. Sir, do you think the bacteria will be survived now? No, sir. The bacteria is not going to survive. Okay, the bacteria is not going to survive. The bacteria will be killed, sir. The bacteria will be killed because of this hydrolytic enzymes. Okay, because of this hydrolytic enzymes, the bacteria will be killed. Okay, bacteria dead, sir. Here, I want to add one important point. One important point. Actually, when phagosome and lysosome, when they fuse, what actually happens is you are killing the bacteria. You are killing the bacteria. But there are two types of killings are normally. There are two types of killings. First, let me tell you. Simple. Look, this is your WBC. Okay, neutrophil. Inside the neutrophil, now what is this? The phagosome. Now it is going to be fused with the... So this is the phagosome. Let me draw. 
This is a phagosome. It is fused with lysosome. Phagosome is fused with the lysosome, sir. Okay, phagosome is fused with the yes, 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 Rini, you are true. Phagosome is fused with the lysosome. Now, do you know what happens? What happens is now phagolysosome is formed, sir. Here is our bacteria. Deko. Here is our bacteria. Okay, the poor bacteria, literally crying, sir. Okay, please leave me, leave me. It's crying. Okay. Now this guy. Now, do you know what happens? Now this neutrophils, the cells, they will take the oxygen. Okay, they will take the oxygen. Oxygen is Something good, right? They will take this oxygen. Now, these oxygen molecules, they are converted into free radicals. Okay, with the help of an enzyme, the oxygen, they will take, this is something called as oxygen-dependent killing. Oxygen-dependent killing. During oxygen-dependent killing, the powerful way, the powerful way of killing the bacteria. Okay, what happens? Oxygen molecules were taken. They are converted into this free radicals. Okay, they are converted into free radicals. With the help of an enzyme called as NADPH oxidase with the help of an enzyme called as NADPH oxidase the oxygen is converted into O2 minus okay O2 minus now this O2 minus with the help of one more enzyme which is called as superoxide dismutase with the help of this superoxide dismutase this oxygen free radicals the superoxide ions the superoxide ions are converted into H2O2 okay H2O2 hydrogen peroxide but this hydrogen peroxide is also not a great chemical, sir. It's not a, it's, yes, of course, it's a free radical, but it's not a powerful thing. Now, this H2O2 will be converted with the help of an enzyme. There is an enzyme called as myeloperoxidase. Okay, with the help of myeloperoxidase inside the lysosomes. Now, what happens? Do you know the one chloride molecule? One chloride molecule is added onto this H2O2. Now, what do you form, sir? At the end of the day, HOCl, hypochlorous acid. Now, hypochlorous acid is getting formed. Okay. So, oxygen is converted into superoxide ion. Superoxide ion with the help of superoxide dismutase is converted into H2O2. This hydrogen peroxide with the help of enzyme myeloid, uh, myeloperoxidase, myeloperoxidase is going to convert it into hypochlorous acid. Sir, this is the most powerful chemical in your body. It's a bleach, sir. Bleach. It's a most powerful free radical. No, do you know what it will do? It will come Without any mercy, it will kill the bacteria, sir. Okay, it will kill the bacteria. So, bacteria is dead. This is something called as oxygen-dependent killing. Okay, by using the oxygen, you kill the bacteria. Okay, so what is formed? Which free radical is formed at the end? Hypochlorous acid, HOCl. The most powerful free radical. Okay, one integration here is, one integration here. Okay, which you need to know for your exam. So, the first step in the oxygen-dependent killing, what is the first step? Conversion of oxygen to free radical, that's a O2 minus uh, superoxide ion. See, this step is mediated by what? NADPH oxidase. This, this step is called as respiratory burst or oxygen burst. Okay, oxygen burst. Now, if there is a deficiency of this enzyme, NADPH oxidase deficiency, if you have deficiency of this enzyme, okay, NADPH oxidase deficiency, it's not there. Can you tell me which disease will occur? Sir, NADPH oxidase is not there, no superoxide ion, without superoxide ion, no H2O2, no HOCl, no, this bacteria cannot be killed. The bacteria will not be killed, sir. It will cause recurrent infections in the person. The bacteria are not being destroyed. So, can you tell me what is this condition called as? Deficiency of NADPH oxidase. This respiratory burst, first reaction is not happening. It will cause which disease, sir? CGD. CGD stands for chronic granulomatous disease, chronic granulomatous disease, it is due to deficiency of NADPH oxidase. If that NADPH oxidase is not there, that will cause chronic granulomatous disease. Okay. So, with this, we have killed the bacteria. Bacteria is dead, sir. So, what we have seen in this total lecture, we have seen acute inflammation. In the acute inflammation, what happens? First, there are certain vascular changes. Vasoconstriction, Vasodilation, increased vascular permeability and stasis. Vascular events. After the vascular events, cellular events will start. Margination, rolling, adhesion, transmigration, hemotaxis and phagocytosis. With phagocytosis, the bacteria is dead. So, cellular events also completed. Important things are, selectins are helping in rolling. Integrins and VCAM, ICAM are helping in adhesion. P cam or CD31 
is helping in what? It is helping in transmigration. Which molecules are helping in chemotaxis? LTB4, C5A and LTB4, uh, C5A molecule and interleukin 8. Which molecules are helping in opsonization, decorating the bacteria so that it will be easy for the neutrophil to consume? It is C3B as well as FC portion of IgG antibody. So with this, we have completed the acute inflammation. Okay, vascular events and cellular events are completed. Before going to the next part, that is the chronic inflammation. Before going to discuss about the chronic inflammation, uh, about the granulomas and wound healing, I have decided to uh, discuss some more important points in the topic of uh, uh, acute inflammation, continuing the acute inflammation. That topic which I am going to discuss now, let's begin with this topic and after this, we can go with the uh, chronic inflammation. Mediators. Okay, so inflammatory mediators. Now, what exactly are these inflammatory mediators? Inflammatory mediators are those chemicals. These are the chemicals which aids in inflammation. Okay, which aids in the inflammation. In the process of inflammation, these chemicals are going to be produced. These chemicals, they will make the inflammation work in easy way. Okay, now having said that, what are the inflammatory mediators? What inflammatory mediators you want to know is, so inflammatory mediators are mainly divided into two types. They are cell derived. Okay, cell derived means a cells are going to produce, cells are going to produce these mediators, cell derived and plasma derived. Okay. Cell derived and plasma derived. Okay. Now, if you have any doubts, you can all the time put it in the chat box. Cell derived. Hello, guys. Hello, everyone. Okay. Cell derived and plasma derived. Now, they go. This cell derived mediators are again further divided into two types. So, cell derived are further divided into two types. What exactly are they? Preformed. Okay. Preformed, which means See, these mediators are always there, okay. So even before the inflammation, cells contain macrophages, neutrophils, they contain these mediators, okay. So they are not produced at the time of inflammation, but from the beginning itself, these mediators are there. So, they are preformed and de novo. Preformed and what are the other type? It's a de novo, so newly formed. De novo means newly formed, okay. Newly synthesized. Okay, newly synthesized. So, preformed mediators are newly synthesized mediators. Okay. So, now plasma. So, plasma derived. See, this plasma derived, it includes complement system. Which you need to know for your exams. As well as clotting. Coagulation. A coagulation cascade. So, these are the things which are going to happen during the inflammation, sir. Inflammation activates the complements. Inflammation, during the inflammation, the blood vessel clotting will happen. Okay, they, whenever there is inflammation, some tissue injury is there. Whenever there is tissue injury, you need to what? You need to do what? You need to prevent the blood loss. If you want to prevent the blood loss, clotting should happen, right? So, for clotting, what are the mediators? We will discuss about that, okay? So, now just tell me, the topics which you are going to discuss are inflammatory mediators, Okay, inflammatory mediators. Now, how many types of inflammatory mediators are there? The inflammatory mediators are broad, broadly classified into two types. What are they? Cell derived mediators, which are produced from the cells and the plasma derived. Okay, so some mediators or something is going to happen in the plasma which aids in the process of inflammation. Now, the preformed. What exactly are the preformed mediators? Preformed means they are there from the beginning. They are there from the beginning. What exactly are they? Histamine. That's your question in your exam. Histamine is an example of preformed mediator and serotonin. Okay, serotonin. So, histamine and serotonin, these are the examples of preformed mediators. Okay, then what are newly synthesized during the time of inflammation? What are newly synthesized? Newly synthesized mediators include right nitric oxide, Okay, nitric oxide, arachidonic acid metabolites, uh, right, arachidonic acid, 
metabolites okay next chemokines cytokines platelet activating factor Platelet activating factor. So these are the newly synthesized. These are these are synthesized at the time of inflammation. What are they? Nitric oxide, platelet activating factor, um, cytokines, chemokines, and even reactive oxygen species. Okay, reactive oxygen species. Those are the free radicals. So these are newly synthesized. Okay, they will help in the process of inflammation. Now, just tell me, just a broad classification. Inflammatory mediators are cell derived as well as plasma derived. The cell derived includes preformed as well as the newly synthesized. So, which substances are going to be newly synthesized? Arachidonic acid metabolites, platelet activating factor, nitric oxide, reactive oxygen species, cytokines, and chemokines. Okay. So, these are the substances which are newly synthesized. Okay. Having said that, now let's begin. Let's begin our topic with the preformed mediators. What are the preformed mediators? See, all the time they are there, sir. From the beginning, they are there. So, first, right. I am going to discuss about cell derived. Okay, they are cell derived, but they are preformed. Okay, preformed. What exactly are they? They are histamine and serotonin, right? Now, let us discuss important points about the histamine. Sir, so, histamine, it is produced from which amino acid? It is made up of which amino acid? Histamine. In the name itself, it is there. Hista. Hista means histidine. So, it is derived from Histidine amino acid. Histidine, sir. Okay. Now, what is the what is the source of histamine in the body? Okay. So, the most important source, the most important source of the histamine in the body is mast cells. So, mast cells are the most important source. Okay, means highest amount of histamine will be released by the mast cells. Not only the mast cells, platelets. Platelets are also going to produce a histamine. So, histamine is produced by mast cells as well as Platelets. And not only that, even some other WBs like basophils produces the histamine. Okay, sir. Now, what is the other preformed mediator? Other preformed mediator I have discussed is serotonin. Other preformed mediator that I have discussed is serotonin. My question to you is, the serotonin, what is the other name for serotonin? 5-hydroxy tryptophan. Okay. So, it is derived from what? This 5-HT, serotonin, it is derived from which amino acid? It is derived, you know it in the name itself, just now I said 5-hydroxy tryptophan, it is tryptophan. Okay. So, serotonin is derived from tryptophan, right? Now, what is the source of serotonin in the body? Source of serotonin cell. Okay. Histamine is, sorry, histamine is produced by the mast cells. Okay. Then who produces the serotonin in the body? Which cells releases the serotonin in the body? The serotonin is released by mainly the main source is enterochromaffin cells. The enterochromaffin cells. The enterochromaffin cells are the richest, uh, are the richest source of serotonin in the body. Now, not only enterochromaffin cells, but also platelets will also release the serotonin. Okay, guys. Now, they go. Sir, you are saying as, okay, histamine is a preformed mediator, serotonin is a preformed mediator, but how they are going to help in the process of inflammation, sir? How exactly they are the inflammatory mediators? What exactly they are doing? See, during the time of inflammation, they are released just like that. Okay, they are going to, they are going to be released just like that. Why? Because they are already preformed. So, now what they will do? Now, what they will do? So, these both serotonin and histamine, I am writing here, both combined. Okay, both this, serotonin and histamine, what they are going to do is, they are going to do vasodilation. Vasodilation. Okay. So, vasodilation is one of the vascular event during inflammation, right? Vasodilation. Okay, vascular event. Now, the other event is increase vascular permeability. Okay, increase vascular permeability. Okay, so vasodilation, increased vascular permeability. In yesterday's class, we have discussed vascular increased vascular permeability is the hallmark of acute inflammation. Okay, 
So, ask the permeability is done by whom? Histamine and serotonin will do that for you. Okay. And they can also do bronchoconstriction. Okay, so they are going doing what? Bronchoconstriction, inflammation, sir. Why? You can ask me why bronchoconstriction. Say, our body is thinking that there is some thing, like you know, there, there is some bad agent that is entering into the body. Okay, try to understand like that. See, there is some bad agent ent entering into the into the body. So that's why the airways, the airways are getting compressed in order to restrict the entry of that bad thing. Okay, maybe bad gas or some toxic gas or something, some poison. Okay, so that's the reason why, see the, why the bronchoconstriction, you can ask me sir, why exactly bronchoconstriction is happening? It's a protective response. The body is thinking that there is some noxious stimulus is coming through. So that's causing the bronchoconstriction. Okay, so anyway, histamine and serotonin, they are the preformed mediators. They will be, they will be immediately released just like that. And what are the uh, things which will happen during the inflammation? Vasodilation, increased vascular permeability and in lungs there can be bronchoconstriction. Now, after this, let's discuss about cell derived only. See, now we are, this is completed. So, this part is completed. Okay. Now, let's discuss about this cell derived only, but newly synthesized. Now, these are going to be newly synthesized. Okay. Now, let's begin. Cell derived, but newly synthesized. Okay, cell derived but newly synthesized. Now, what are they? You already know, you guys already know, just for recap, nitric oxide is one thing. What is the second thing? Arachidonic acid metabolites. Okay, arachidonic acid metabolites and the platelet activating factor, PAF, platelet activating factor, cytokines. Okay, cytokines, uh, chemokines. Okay, so these are the things now we have to discuss. Okay, we have to discuss about these things. Okay, these five things we have to discuss about. Now, tell me, uh, what's the first thing? First, let's discuss about this nitric oxide. Okay, now let's write nitric oxide, sir. So, now let's discuss about the first one, nitric oxide. The first important MCQ is, so this nitric oxide, okay, this nitric oxide, it's actually produced where? So, this nitric oxide, how it is produced is the little biochemistry, I am just going into little biochemistry, it is derived from an amino acid called as L-arginine, okay. So, there is this amino acid which is called as L-arginine. So, this L-arginine, when it is acted upon by, when it is acted upon by an enzyme called as a nitric oxide synthase, NOS nitric oxide synthase. Okay, now I am asking you guys, tell me, how many nitric oxide synthase do you know? How many types of nitric oxide synthase do you know? See, when al arginine, when arginine is acted upon by this enzyme called as nitric oxide synthase, now this arginine, it will be converted into nitric oxide. Okay, it will be divided, it will be converted into nitric oxide. Okay, now my question to you is, how many types of nitric oxide do you know? So, how many types of um, this enzyme, how many types of nitric oxide synthase do you know guys? There are three types. There are three types of nitric oxide synthase. Do you know what are they? First type is ENOS. Okay, ENOS. Endothelial nitric oxide synthase. Second type is NOS, neuronal. Okay, NOS, neuronal nitric oxide synthase. And third one is INOS. Okay, inducible nitric oxide synthase. Inducible nitric oxide synthase. So there are three types of nitric oxide synthases in three different places. Now L arginine. See now when L arginine, when this amino acid, it is acted upon by this enzyme nitric oxide synthase, it is going to be converted into nitric oxide as well as citrulline. Okay, as well as citrulline. Okay, citrulline. That's not important for us. My question to you is, sir, what the hell this nitric oxide will do? So, nitric oxide, it is acting on the cells, it is going to act on the blood vessels. I mean, it is acting on the blood vessels, it is going to cause what? Vasodilation. Now again, so it see, it is doing vasodilation. So, is it going to help us, is it going to help us during inflammation or not? Definitely, it is going to help us during the inflammation, right? It will cause vasodilation. So, more blood flow to the tissues, more neutrophils will come, more macrophages will come, more antibodies will come, okay? More complement proteins will come. 
something like that okay so it's going to cause the vasodilation do you know any other do you know any other functions of this nitric oxide guys it's anti aggregant sir anti aggregant what exactly is anti aggregant it inhibits the platelet aggregation okay inhibits platelet aggregation Okay, it inhibits the platelet aggregation. So, normally in a normal blood vessel, see in a normal blood vessel, we do not want any clots. In a normal blood vessel, we do not want any clots. So, nitric oxide, what it will do is, it inhibits the platelet aggregation in a normal healthy blood vessels. Okay. So, these are the two important points about the nitric oxide which I want you to know. Okay. So, it is helping in vasodilation as well as it is antiplatelet aggregant. Now, after this, let us discuss about the second mediator, second newly produced mediator, sir. Okay. Now, first let us discuss about, it. at the end I will discuss about the uh, arachidonic acid metabolites, at the end I will discuss about that. Now, first let us discuss about the PAF, PAF. So, what exactly is PAF? Guys, can you tell me PAF means platelet, the second one, platelet, activating, factor. So, the platelet activating factor. Now, this platelet activating factor, what it will do? How it is going to helpful for us? This platelet activating factor. See, from the inflamed area, this platelet activating factor is getting produced. Now, how it is going to helpful for us? It will do three functions. Sir. There are three functions which will help us during inflammation. Okay. One is it will do vasodilation. But in low concentration, it will do vasodilation. But in low concentration, predominantly it will do vasoconstriction. So, platelet activating factor is the one thing which can do both. In low concentration, it will do the vasodilation. In high concentration, it will do vasoconstriction. Not only that, not only that, during inflammation, say, during inflammation, tissues are getting damaged, blood vessels are getting damaged, you need to have the clots. So, platelet aggregant, platelet aggregation. Yes, excellent. Platelet activating factor in the name itself is there is activating the platelets. So, platelet adhesion, aggregation followed by clot, clot formation will occur. Okay, clotting will occur. And next, do you know any other function of platelet activating factor? It is one of the powerful vasoconstrictant. Okay. It will cause bronchoconstriction. Bronchoconstriction. Okay. So, previously you have seen. Who is causing the bronchoconstriction? Ekbar dekho. Sir, bronchoconstriction is done by histamine. Okay, histamine causes the bronchoconstriction, sir. Okay, done. Now, not only histamine, but also, now the platelet activating factor is causing the bronchoconstriction. Okay, but I want you to answer. I want you to answer, guys. Tell me, which cytokine do you know? Okay, just tell me that chemical, which is the potent bronchoconstrictor out of all histamine, serotonin, like, you know, so many things are there. Out of all the things which you know, which is the most potent bronchoconstrictant? Okay, which chemical will cause bronchoconstriction more powerfully? Do you have any idea? The most potent bronchoconstrictor, okay, let me write here itself. It will come again. Most potent bronchoconstrictor. Is leukotrienes. Okay, so leukotrienes. Leukotrienes, leukotrienes before, leukotrienes are the most potent bronchoconstrictor, sir. Okay, done. Now, after platelet activating factor, now let us discuss about some chemokines. Okay, chemokines. Now, from the inflammatory area, now these chemokines are going to be produced. Okay, chemokines. Okay, sir, what exactly are these chemokines, if you ask me? Sir, what exactly are these chemokines? Sir, so the name itself is there. Chemo means chemicals. Kinds helping in movement. So, chemokines are what? These are the chemotactic agents. Okay, they help in the, uh, they, they help in attracting the WBCs to the area of inflammation. Okay, so chemokines are nothing but the cytokines. They go, chemokines are nothing but the cytokines. They help in movement of the blood cells or, or uh, WBC towards the area of inflammation. Okay, so these are the chemo attractants, right? Chemo. Attractants. These are the chemo attractants. Now, how many types of chemokines are there? Okay, there are different types of chemokines. Uh, like you know, based on the structure, based on the structure, there are different types of chemokines. Now, let me write one by one. The first type of chemokines are called as C chemokines, C type. Okay, C chemokines. The second type is called as CC chemokines. 
The third type is called as CXC. Okay, CXC type of chemokines. Uh, see, it's all based on the structure. What is our C? What is CX? Okay, it's based on the structure. We don't want to go in that much detail. So the third type of uh, fourth type of chemokines are called as CX3C chemokines. CX3C chemokines. Okay, these are the different types of chemokines. What all these chemokines will do? I will give you the examples. Okay, I will give you the example of every class. What is C chemokine? What is CC chemokine? What is CXC chemokine? What, what is CX3C chemo uh, chemokine? I will give you the examples. Important, sir. Important. Now. All these agents at the end of the day, they help in what? They help in movement, chemo attractants, chemo taxes, kind of thing. Okay. Now, let's begin with the first C chemokine. Okay, let's begin with the C chemokine. This is the first example I'm giving you. Lymphotactin. One more, lymphotactin. Now you tell me, sir, this C chemokine, which is a lymphotactin, now tell me, it's going to attract which cells? It's going to attract which cells? Basic thing, lymphocytes. Okay, it's going to attract the lymphocytes. Simple, right? Now, can you give me an example of CC chemokine? CC chemokine? CC chemokine example, sir. Eotaxin. Okay, eotaxin. Rantis. Okay, these are all examples. Okay, these are all examples. Eotaxin, Rantis, and MCP. See, no need to go in that much detail. Okay, no need to go into the full forms. Sir, what I'm showing you here is this lymphotactin is a chemical. It's a chemo. It's a chemo attractant. It helps in the recruitment. It helps in the recruitment of the lymphocytes to the area of inflammation. And eotaxin, rantis, MCP, all these are all these are all examples of chemo attractants. Now tell me, eotaxin, the name itself is there. It's going to recruit what? It cells. It's going to recruit eosinophils. Okay, it's going to recruit eosinophils. And rantis, rantis, these are going to recruit which cells? T cells. Okay, and MCP in the name itself is there. M stands for macrophages. So, recruitment of the macrophages. So, C chemokines example is lymphotactin. C C chemokines examples are eotaxin, uh, rantis, and MCP. These are all examples of the C C chemokines. Now, C X C chemokine. What are the example of which? Say the NEET PG exam. This kind of questions might uh, might come in your exam. Which of the following is a C X C chemokine? Okay, which of the following is coming under the family of CXC chemokines? Okay, so it's the interleukin 8. Even in last class we have discussed interleukin 8, sir. Interleukin 8 is one of the important chemo attractant for the neutrophils. Okay, we have discussed neutrophils. Okay, and CX, last one. CX3C chemokines. CX3C chemokines examples are fractalkane. Okay. Okay. So this fractalkane, it's going to recruit which cells? It's going to recruit T cells and monocytes. So these are the chemicals, okay, which you need to know. First thing, chemokines are what? They are chemo attractant agents, sir. They are the chemo attractant agents. How many types are there? Four types. C chemokines, CC, CXC, CX3C. Done. Sir, lymphotactin is an example of C. Eotaxin is an example of CC. Next, interleukin is an example of CXC. And last, fractalkin is an example of CX3C. Done. Okay. And which cells they are recruiting, which cells they are attracting, I have given the list. Done, sir. So, we have done with the chemokines also. Now, after doing the chemokines, first, listen, chemokines are what? They are nothing but the cytokines. They are nothing but the cytokines which are helping in the attraction of the blood cells, okay, the WBC, different types of WBC. Now, I am going to discuss about uh, cytokines, which type of cytokines, now I am going to discuss about interleukins, okay, first cytokines, okay, chemokines are also cytokines, now which type of cytokines I am going to discuss about, I am going to discuss about interleukins, interleukins, okay. Now, very important area, lots and lots of times the questions will come from this area, interleukin, sir, okay? <laughs> there is no such uh, mnemonic, okay? You need to buy hard it, sir, you need to buy hard it. There is uh, no mnemonic, but in future, I will try to make a mnemonic, sir. See, for me, just like, you know, it's there in the mind. If you repeat it many times, you can, uh, like, you know. So, out of this, if you ask me, out of this one thing, sir, I want to remember one thing. See, this interleukin 8 attracts neutrophils. It is belonging to CXC. That's the question. 
Okay, that's the question, sir. Next, we are going to discuss about the interleukins. Now tell me, which type of interleukins do you know? Fun word. Which type of interleukins do you know? There are many interleukins. Now, okay. Now, let's discuss about some important interleukins which are needed for your exam. Okay, from this chapter of the inflammation, which kind of question, uh, which type of uh, interleukins are most important? Okay, now, just let's begin with the interleukin one. Okay, interleukin one. So, this interleukin one, what it will cause? So, now there is some inflammation going on in the body. Now, these interleukins are going to be produced. Okay, now interleukins are produced by different different types of WBCs. Now this interleukins, okay, they are produced by the WBCs. Sir. These interleukins are produced by the WBCs. Now these interleukins are going to cause what? Interleukin 1. Can you tell me one important point about the interleukin 1? Interleukin 1 causes what? Interleukin 1 is a, uh, interleukin 1 is a, uh, interleukin it is going to cause a fever. It's a pyrogen. It's a pyrogen, sir. Interleukin 1 is a, one of the important pyrogen. Even we have discussed this in the topic of the pyroptosis. In the, in the topic of the pyroptosis, I have discussed caspase number, caspase number 1 activates interleukin 1. Interleukin 1 causes fever, pyroptosis topic. Okay. Now, interleukin 5. Okay, go and watch the topic. Pyroptosis is also very important for your exam. Interleukin 5, what it will do? Interleukin 5, it will cause eosinophil activation. Eosinophil activation. Okay, eosinophil activation, sir. Activation of the eosinophils, not the recruitment. Eotaxin is the one which helps in the recruitment. Eotaxin. They go. Eotaxin is helping the in the is helping in the recruitment of the neutrophils, not the activation. Now, interleukin five helps in eosinophil activation, sir. Interleukin six. Any idea, guys? Interleukin six again fever. Okay, again, it's going to cause a fever and interleukin-6 have an important role in the regulation of the acute phase reactants. In the end, I will discuss about the acute phase reactants. Uh, during the time of inflammation in our body, certain proteins will go up and certain proteins will go down. These are the acute phase reactants. So, it's a regulation. Interleukin-6, one more important MCQ is, it's a regulation of, okay, regulation MCQ. Interleukin-6, it helps in regulation of acute phase reactants okay now for example see now imagine you are having some inflammation right now you are having inflammation in your body now we know c reactive protein is going to be elevated okay c reactive protein is going to be elevated so who elevates the c reactive protein who increases c reactive protein levels who regulates the, who regulates which interleukin regulates this interleukin 6 okay interleukin 6 now after that interleukin 7 sir what it will do it helps in the t cell maturation it helps in t cell maturation okay it helps in the t-cell maturation interleukin 8 where we have discussed interleukin 8 just now we have discussed sir just now interleukin 8 they go same interleukin say this interleukin yes it is a coming it's also a chemokine it's also a chemokine it helps in it helps in recruitment of the neutrophils right so interleukin 8 what is doing recruits recruits neutrophils Okay, it recruits the neutrophils, neutro neutrophil recruitment. And the last, very, very important, it, this is my favorite, this is my favorite, sir. This is something special. Out of all the interleukins, this is something special, sir. Do you know what is that? The interleukins normally, they are pro-inflammatory, right? They are, they are helping in the process of inflammation. Okay, they are helping in the process of the inflammation. Now, interleukin 10 is the one interleukin which is, any idea? Any idea, fun mode? Rain, fun mode? Any idea? Interleukin 10 it is anti-inflammatory. anti-inflammatory sir. So, in your future, if someone asks you which interleukin is anti-inflammatory, it's interleukin 10. Interleukin 10 sir. Now, it's only anti-inflammatory. It's only anti-inflammatory. So, say some, for example, say tissue damage occurred. Tissue damage occurred. Inflammation have started. Now, lots and lots of neutrophils came, macrophages came, complement systems are activated. Now, once healing occurs, once healing occurs, everything is set right sir. Now, the bacteria is killed, everything is now normal. Now, do you want still the inflammation in this area? No. What do we want? We want? We want to take out the inflammation from that area. 
So that is who is going to do that job for you? Interleukin 10, anti-inflammatory now. Now anti-inflammatory will stop the inflammation. Okay. Next, interleukin 4 and 6, these are both, both pro as well as anti-inflammatory. So, for us as a doctors, we have to know these basic things, okay. Basic things in the sense to clear the exam, to clear the exam, okay. I won't say these are going to be helpful for you in your clinical practice, but sir, we need to know this for clearing our exams, okay. Keep that in mind. So, interleukin 1 is going to cause the fever, it's a pyrogen. Interleukin 5 for the activation of the eosinophils. Interleukin 6 for fever and regulation of the acute phase reactants. Interleukin 7 for T-cell T -cell maturation. Interleukin 8 recruits the neutrophils. And interleukin 10 is anti-inflammatory. Interleukin 4 and 6 both anti-inflammatory as well as pro-inflammatory. Uh, pro, pro okay. So, these are about the this, these cytokines which we have discussed are the interleukins. Now, let's discuss about some other cytokines, or other types of cytokines, okay, other chemicals. Cytokines means what? Cyto means cell. Kinds are the chemicals which are getting produced. Cytokines are produced by the cells, okay, inflammatory cells. Now, let's discuss about TNF, okay, TNF. So, how many types of TNF do you know? TNF alpha, you know about the TNF alpha, right? Now, similar thing, similar thing, <clears throat> human necrosis factor, TNF means human necrosis factor, TNF alpha. Similar thing, sir, transforming growth factor beta, transforming growth factor alpha, okay, transfer you, let's put it this way, transforming growth factor alpha, transforming growth factor beta. Now, my dear students, come on, fun more, Doreen, answer this. So, TNF alpha, TNF alpha is going to cause what? Do you have any idea what TNF alpha is going to cause in our body? It's responsible for which, uh, like, you know, inflammatory, uh, a reaction. It helps in, like how it's going to help us in inflammation, sir. See, let me tell you, TNF alpha, it's going to cause a fever again. So, where we have seen fever previously, sir, interleukin 1, they go, interleukin 1 causes the fever and interleukin 6 also causes the fever. So, now you should know interleukin 1, interleukin 6 as well as TNF alpha are going to cause fever, sir are going to cause fever and not only that, TNF alpha, if you want to remember one more point, so TNF alpha is going to cause cachexia, sir, cachexia, weight loss, severe weight loss, okay, cachexia, the cancer patient, cancer cachexia patients, TNF alpha is going to cause the weight loss also. Now, TGF alpha, transforming growth factor alpha, so this transforming growth factor alpha, one important point for your exams, okay, for your exams, the one thing which I want you to know is, this TNF alpha levels are elevated in a disease, sir, there is a disease in which the TNF alpha levels are elevated, can you tell me the disease? It's a gastric problem. It's a gastric problem. Uh, I will tell you what's the problem also. There is hyperplasia of the foveolar cells, hyperplasia of the foveolar cells in the stomach. There is this one disease where there is hyperplasia of the foveolar cells in the stomach leading to, leading to cerebriform appearance of the gastric mucosa. If you look at the stomach, if you look at the stomach, the gastric rugae, the gastric rugae, they will look like a brain. They will look like a brain. This is called as a cerebriform appearance. So now can you tell me what is the disease? The disease in which the TNF alpha levels are elevated, leading to cerebriform appearance of the gastric mucosa. So that disease here it's called as, okay, that disease it's called as Menetrier's disease. Okay, that disease is called as Menetrier's disease. Okay. And TGF beta is going to cause a fibrosis, sir. TGF beta it's going to help in wound healing, wound healing fibrosis. Okay, mainly the wound healing, sir, fibrosis. Okay, so during healing, fi uh, like you know, fiber uh, fiber deposition, healing should occur, right? Fibro uh, like you know, fibrogenic. This TGF beta is fibrogenic. More and more fib fibers, collagen fibers will be deposited, so scar formation will occur. Okay, so three types we have discussed: TNF alpha for fever, TNF alpha for cachexia also. Okay. Okay, cachexia, cancer cachexia. Now, TGF alpha transforming growth factor alpha for the meningitis disease, TGF beta for fibrosis. Now, after this, let's discuss about some more cytokines, some more cytokines. These are called as interferons. Now, how many types of interferons do you know? I'm asking you. Green, how many types of interferons do you know? Okay, same. Any idea about the interferons? Same. Macrophages, let's write. Macrophages. These macrophages are going to produce an interferon called as interferon alpha, sir. Interferon alpha is produced by 
Yes, alpha, beta, gamma. Yes, three types of interferons. What are they? Interferon alpha, interferon beta, and interferon gamma. Interferon alpha, interferon beta, interferon gamma. My question to you is, okay, my question to you is, sir, interferon alpha is produced by macrophages. Okay, sir. Then who produces interferon beta? Who produces interferon beta? So this interferon beta, it is produced by fibroblast. Okay, fibroblasts are going to produce an interferon beta. Then who produces the interferon gamma? It's the T helper 1 cells. Okay, T helper 1 cells. So macrophages, macrophages produces the alpha, fibroblast produces the beta, T helper 1 cells produces the gamma, interferon gamma. Okay, now question to you is, in your exams, every time this, like you know, many times in your viva exams, they might ask you this. Sir, macrophage, macrophages produces the TNF alpha. So what is the function of this TNF alpha? So this TNF alpha function, exam point of view, so it is antiviral, okay, antiviral, okay, it's antiviral. TNF beta, for your exam point of view, okay, for your exam point of view, one important point about this TNF beta is, so this TNF beta is actually, we use, sir, we use, we synthesize this TNF beta and we use this TNF beta for the treatment of, use it in the treatment of, which disease, there is a disease, there is a disease, in which we use the in interferon beta. Can you tell me? That is multiple sclerosis. There is a disease called as multiple sclerosis, sir. It's a demyelinating disorder in the central nervous system. Demyelinating disorder in the central nervous system, sir. Multiple sclerosis. Now, in that disease, we use TNF beta. Okay, TNF beta. Next and last one, interferon gamma, sir, interferon gamma. So, this interferon gamma is helping in, it is going to be mainly helpful during the chronic inflammation, during the chronic inflammation, uh, during granuloma formation. Okay, during granuloma formation, sir. Okay, granuloma formation. So, done. So, the three type of interferons I have discussed in your exam, they will ask you TNF, sorry, interferon alpha, interferon beta, interferon gamma. Interferon alpha is produced by the macrophages, interferon beta is produced by the fibroblast and interferon gamma is produced by the T helper 1 cells. And their important points for your exam, I have explained you, okay. So, these are also, these are also the chemicals which are going to helpful during the process of inflammation, no doubt. Now, after this, see, Deco guys, first, let us look here, what we are discussing, we have started with the newly synthesized mediators, okay, newly synthesized mediators. Okay, cell derived cells are producing them, but newly synthesized. What we have completed, we have discussed about the nitric oxide. Okay, from L arginine, nitric oxide synthase, three types of nitric oxide causing the vasodilation, antiplatelet aggregate. We have discussed about the platelet activating factor also. We have discussed about the cytokines and chemokines. Different types of cytokines I have discussed interleukins, okay, uh, transforming growth factor alpha, transforming growth factor beta. Also, we have discussed about the interferons. Now, after this, last, let us discuss about the arachidonic acid metabolites. Okay, arachidonic acid metabolites, sir. Now I am asking you, I am asking you, sir, arachidonic acid, where it is present? So this arachidonic acid, now let us write. Come on, guys. Arachidonic acid metabolites. Guys, can you tell me where this arachidonic acids are present? Arachidonic acid metabolites. From where it will come, sir? Okay, uh, let us put it this way. From where this arachidonic acid will come, sir? Breakdown of which product? Breakdown of which product can give you arachidonic acids? So let me tell you, okay, if you don't know, please look here. See, you are having, you are having all the cells, right? Okay, you are having millions and millions of cells. So the cells are made up of what? Cell membranes. The cell membranes are made up of what? Cell membranes are made up of proteins, lipids and carbohydrates, you know it. Sir, I am talking about the lipids now. What is the most important lipid? The most important lipid of the cell membrane is phospholipids, okay? So now let us take this phospholipids. Phospholipids, okay? So now, in the cell membrane, there is a phospholipid, sir. Now, this phospholipid, it is going to be broken down. It is going to be broken down with the help of an enzyme called as, enzyme, I will show you with a different color. It is broken down with the help of a, yes, phospholipids. Yes, yes, uh, it's an you are true. These phospholipids are going to be broken down with the help of an enzyme called as phospholipase. Phospholipase. Okay, phospholipase. Okay. So, phospholipase A2, the enzyme name is called as a phospholipase A2 or C. Okay, phospholipase A2 and phospholipase C. Now, these phospholipids are broken down. In the name itself, it's that they go phospholipase. 
phospholipids are going to be broken down into what? Into arachidonic acid. Into arachidonic acid. Arachidonic acid. Okay. Okay, arachidonic acid, sir. Now, this is how arachidonic acids are produced. Now, they go. Sir, these arachidonic acids, now, they can, now, let's, let me show you like this. Sir, these arachidonic acids, now, they can go into four pathways. This one single arachidonic acid molecule, it's a raw material, sir. Now, this arachidonic acid, if it is acted upon by an enzyme called as cyclooxygenase, this is an enzyme. Okay, if this arachidonic acid is acted upon by cyclooxygenase, do you know what happens? Do you know what's going to be produced? Sir, prostaglandins and thromboxin A2. Okay, so just I'm giving you the blueprint, sir. I'm giving you the blueprint. Okay, so now this arachidonic acid, when it is acted upon by an enzyme called a cyclooxygenase, now prostaglandins and thromboxin A2 are going to be produced. Next, next, when this arachidonic acid, when it is acted upon by an enzyme called as lipooxygenase, okay, acted upon by an enzyme called as lipooxygenase, do you know who are going to be produced? Leukotrienes. Okay, leukotrienes are going to be produced. Sir, if the same arachidonic acid, if it is acted upon by cytochrome enzymes, cytochrome, P450 enzyme, which is called as epoxygenase. Okay, cytochrome P450 epoxygenase. Do you know who is going to be produced? There is a molecule that is going to produce, which is called as, it's a big name, it's a big name. Any, any idea, guys? Any idea, guys? Now, this arachidonic acid, see, when this arachidonic acid, when it is acted upon by cytochrome P50 epoxygenase, then which molecules are going to be produced? Do you have any idea? Now, let me tell you, epoxy, okay, epoxygenase, right? So, epoxy, icosa, okay, epoxy, icosa, trionic, acid. So, it's a very big name. You don't need to remember this much big name. You can simply call it as EET. Okay, EET, -E epoxy, icosa, trionic acid. EET, sir. Now, okay, done. So, the arachidonic acid, sir, it is when it is acted upon by an enzyme called a cyclooxygenase. So, prostaglandins and thromboxin A2 are produced. When the arachidonic acid is acted upon by lipooxygenase, leukotrienes are produced. When the same arachidonic acid, when it is acted upon by an enzyme called as um, <coughs> cytochrome P450 epoxygenase, then EET is going to be produced. And last one, sir, last one. When it is acted upon by, okay, when it is going into Isoicosanoid pathway, when it is going into, it's a non-enzymatic non pathway. Now, when it is going into iso, icosanoid, iso, icosanoid pathway. Okay, so icosanoid pathway, then do you know what is going to be produced? Any idea? Yes, icosanoid pathway. Isoprostein is going to be produced. Isoprostein. Okay, this is how is isoprostein is produced. Sir, isoprostein is the one which causes the vasoconstriction. Okay, it's going to cause the vasoconstriction. Now, if you ask me, sir, what this EET will do? Sir, EET is going to do vasodilation. So, these are the miscellaneous things. The last two things are miscellaneous things. Even if you don't know for your MBBS level, not a big deal. Okay, but the first two are very important, sir. First two are very important. So, what I am trying to put in your mind is, they go. Now, Phospholipids which are there in your cell membrane, they are acted upon by an enzyme called as phospholipase A2. So, this phospholipase A2 is going to break the phospholipids into arachidonic acids. Now, these arachidonic acids, they can go into the pathway of cyclooxygenase, lipooxygenase, or they can go enter, they can enter into the epoxygenase pathway or isoicosanoid pathway. But the first two are very important, sir. First two are very important. See, when this arachidonic acid, okay, let's write the cyclooxygenase pathway. Now, I am writing with the cyclooxygenase pathway, right? First, let's see. Cyclo oxygenase pathway. Okay, cyclo oxygenase pathway. Now, in the cyclo oxygenase pathway, what is happening? I will write from the beginning. Okay, write from the beginning, sir. So, membrane phospholipids. What do you have? Membrane phospholipids. Now, tell me. So, this membrane phospholipids, they are acted upon by what? They are acted upon by Phospholipase A2. Okay, phospholipase A2 or C, phospholipase C. Now, when they are acted upon by phospholipase A2, now what happens, sir? It's going, phospholipids are going to be broken down into arachidonic 
Okay, they are going to be broken down into what? Arachidonic acid. Arachidonic acid. Now this arachidonic acid, now I am discussing that. Now when this arachidonic acid, it is acted upon by, guys look here. When this arachidonic acid, when it is acted upon by cyclooxygenase enzyme, when it is acted upon by the cyclooxygenase enzyme, then what happens? Sir, now what happens is this arachidonic acid is now getting converted into prostaglandins. Which prostaglandin? Prostaglandin G2. Okay, prostaglandin G2. Here I want to add one more point. Sir, how many types of cyclooxygenases do you know? There are two, two types of cyclooxygenases, sir. Okay, cyclooxygenase 1, which is normally physiologically active, and cyclooxygenase 2. Okay, cyclooxygenase 1 and cyclooxygenase 2. So, both the cyclooxygenase 1 and cyclooxygenase 2, they are going to do what? They are going to convert the arachidonic acid into prostaglandin G2. Okay, prostaglandin G2. Now, this prostaglandin G2, now it will be later converted into prostaglandin H2. Okay, prostaglandin H2 with the help of, uh, due to the process of peroxidase. Okay, with the help of this enzyme peroxidase, the prostaglandin G2 is converted into prostaglandin H2. Now, see what happened to this prostaglandin H2. Now, point is, this prostaglandin H2, now if it is acted upon by an enzyme called as thromboxin synthase, now it is acted upon by what? Thromboxin synthase. Okay, thromboxin synthase. Okay, thromboxin synthase. Okay, thromboxin synthase. Now, what happens? Thromboxin A2 is going to be produced. Now, you understood how thromboxin A2 is produced now? Sir, in the cyclooxygenase pathway, the membrane phospholipids are broken down by phospholipase A2. Arachidonic acid is produced. When this arachidonic acid is acted upon by cyclooxygenase enzyme, prostaglandin G2 is produced. The prostaglandin G2 is converted into prostaglandin H2. Now, this prostaglandin H2, when it is acted upon by an enzyme called as thromboxin synthase, now, thromboxin A2 is produced, sir. Now, what is the function of this thromboxin A2? Do you know any idea? Do you have any idea? Do you have any idea what, what happens? Uh, like what this thromboxin A2 is going to do? TXA2, thromboxin A2. Sir, actually this is going to happen in the platelet, sir. Now, this thromboxin A2 is going to cause a platelet aggregation. Platelet aggregation. Clot, sir. Okay, helps in the platelet aggregation. Now, this prostaglandin H2, when it is acted upon by an enzyme called as, right? This prostaglandin H2, now it is acted upon by prostaglandin, okay? E2, T2, F2, synthase. Okay, now what is the enzyme? See, they go. Now, the enzyme name itself is prostaglandin E2, D2, F2 alpha. This is F2 alpha synthase. Now, this prostaglandin H2 will be converted into, now this prostaglandin H2 will be converted into prostaglandin E2, prostaglandin D2 and prostaglandin F2 alpha. Okay, this is how prostaglandin E2 is produced. Prostaglandin E2, prostaglandin D2, prostaglandin F2, these are all produced because of uh, they are all coming from prostaglandin H2 with the help of this enzyme, prostaglandin E2D2 F2 alpha synthase. Okay. Now, my questions for your exams. This prostaglandin E2, okay, whenever you are having pain, right, that pain is because of this prostaglandin, sir. Inflammation, pain, pain. This prostaglandin E2 sensitizes the nerve endings, okay, causes the pain. So, this is the one responsible for pain. Next, prostaglandin D2. Sir, all the prostaglandins, remember prostaglandins will cause a vasodilation, sir. Okay, prostaglandin D2, it will cause vasodilation. Vasodilation. This prostaglandin F2 alpha, it is called as carboprost. So, this carboprost, again the same thing. Okay, again the same thing, carboprost, you will study in your gynecology, sir. Okay, so carboprost, you, shall, you will study in your option X gynecology. Okay, there it will come. Okay, prostaglandin F2 alpha. Okay, actually it is used to, uh, like you know, it is used, it's, 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 a, it's a uterine contractant also, sir. It will cause the contractions. Okay, it's a uterine contractant also. You will study there in your obstetrics gynecology. Now, prostaglandin H2, when it is acted upon by, okay, when it is acted upon by an enzyme called as prostacyclin synthase. Okay, let me write here itself. When it is acted upon by an enzyme called as prosta cyclin synthase 
okay prostacycline synthase now do you know what happens to this pgh2 sir prostacycline h2 now it will be converted into pgi2 okay pgi2 this is called as prostacycline okay, this is called as a prostacycline so what this will do sir prostacycline this is a very important thing this is my favorite prostacycline now this is the one which causes the vasodilation okay vasodilation during inflammation so prosta prostaglandin i2 prostacycline prostacycline and it also inhibits sir this it this inhibits sir now see this prostacycline prostacycline in a normal healthy blood vessel it causes the vasodilation and it is anti platelet okay it's anti platelet sir okay it's anti platelet what does it mean what does i mean by it inhibits inhibits platelet aggregation Okay, it inhibits the platelet aggregation. So done. Okay. So these are the points which I want you to know. So arachidonic acid pathway. Okay, is it clear? Arachidonic acid pathway. Now here I have just okay. Let me first sum up, sir. Let let me first sum up. Now they go. First I have discussed with the cyclooxygenase pathway. Okay, I am discussing about the cyclooxygenase pathway. When the membrane phospholipids are broken down by phospholipase A two, now arachidonic acid is produced. Now when this arachidonic acid, when it is acted upon by an enzyme called as cyclooxygenase. do you know why no, you can ask me sir why the cyclooxygenase is activated because the cyclooxygenase they go what exactly happens during inflammation is maybe because of bacteria lipopolysaccharides okay or interleukin 1 or tnf alpha okay all the substances they will activate this cyclooxygenase 2 sir they will activate this enzyme this enzyme called as cyclooxygenase 2 especially during pathological conditions the cyclooxygenase 2 is activated so arachidonic acid now gets converted into prostaglandin g2 prostaglandin g2 will be converted into prostaglandin h2 this from here from here pathways differ sir so from here this prostaglandin h2 can enter into the pathway of thromboxynidase synthesis can enter into the pathway of prostacyclin synthesis or can enter into the pathway of prostaglandin e2 d2 f2 synthesis okay depends on the enzyme the product will be the end product will be differ okay now here look all this whatever i'm showing you okay all this whatever i'm showing you here what exactly are, what exactly these things sir guys tell you can you tell me what exactly are these these are the inflammatory mediators right they are going to cause what they are going to cause the inflammation now imagine now i'm having severe inflammation going on in my body now imagine i'm having arthritis sir inflammation i'm having inflammation pain now what you need to do as a doctor you have to decrease my pain so what you have to do what you have to do with this inflammatory mediators you have to decrease this inflammatory mediators how can you decrease the inflammatory mediators by giving steroids steroids are anti inflammatory you know it steroids are anti inflammatory do you know what steroids will do so steroids okay so steroids will inhibit this okay steroids are going to inhibit the phospholipase a2 that's it okay if you inhibit the steroid sir if you inhibit the phospholipase a2 the production of this inflammatory mediators decrease so inflammation automatically decreases sir or you can inhibit the cyclooxygenase also you can inhibit the cyclooxygenase who can inhibit the cyclooxygenases so nsaids non steroidal anti inflammatory drugs you know it right acyclofenac diclofenac ibuprofen these are the non steroid anti inflammatory drugs they decreases your pain how they decreases your pain sir because they inhibiting the cyclooxygenase when the cyclooxygenase inhibited see when the cyclooxygenase is inhibited what happens prostaglandin e2 production goes down so automatically pain decreases sir prostaglandin e2 causes the pain so if you inhibit the if you inhibit the cox pathway prostaglandin e2 decreases pain decreases okay as simple as that okay as simple as that okay so prostaglandin e2 can also cause a fever sir prostaglandin e2 can also cause a fever okay now after this after this guys shall we discuss about the lipoxenase pathway what we have discussed let's let's recap see now we have discussed about this now we have seen how prostaglandins are getting produced how thromboxynidase is getting produced now what we have to discuss now we have discuss about the lipoxenase pathway simple okay let's discuss about the lipoxenase pathway again same thing i am beginning with this membrane phospholipids okay lipo lipoxenase pathway Okay, lipoxenase pathway, sir. Now let's begin with membrane phospholipids.
Now this membrane phospholipids tell me what happens. With the help of enzyme phospholipase A2, C, now it's going to be broken down into arachidonic acid. Now this arachidonic acid, now they call. Now this arachidonic acid, it is acted upon by lipooxygenases. How many types of lipooxygenases are there? There are two types of lipooxygenases. What are these two types of lipooxygenases? Five lipooxygenases, 12 lipooxygenases. Five lox and 12 lox. Five lipooxygenases and 12 lipooxygenases. Okay, so two types of lipooxygenases, sir. Now when it is acted upon by five lipooxygenases, now tell me what happens if it is acted upon by five lipooxygenases, which substance is going to be produced? Which leukotriene is going to be produced? Which leukotriene is going to be produced? Sir, LTA4. LTA4 is going to be produced. If it is acted upon by 12 lipooxygenase, okay, first we will come to the 12 later. 12 later, first let us discuss about the 5 lipooxygenase. Sir, now arachidonic acid, now it is acted upon by 5 lipooxygenase. Now LTA4 is produced. Now do you know what happens? Sir, now this LTA4, look, now this LTA4, it can be acted upon by, okay, it can be acted upon by, okay. Now it can be acted upon by LT, LTC4 synthase. There is an enzyme called as LTC4 synthase. Okay, LTC4 synthase. So now leukotriene C4 is produced. Okay, leukotriene C4. Okay, that's a leukotriene C4, sir. Okay. Now leukotriene C4 is produced. Now this leukotriene C4, it can be converted into leukotriene D4. Now this leukotriene D4 can be converted into leukotriene E4 with the help of different different enzymes. Okay, with the help of different different enzymes, the leukotriene C4 will be converted to leukotriene D4, leukotriene E4. That enzymes that's a total biochemistry thing, sir. If you want me to write, yes, the gamma glutamyl transferase, the gamma gamma glutamyl transferase. Okay, gamma glutamyl transferase is going to convert the LC uh, leukotriene C4 into leukotriene D4. The leukotriene D4 will be will be converted into leukotriene E4 with the help of enzyme di peptidase. Okay, di peptidase, which are not that important for you. The point which I want you to know is the arachidonic acid it enters into the pathway of leukotrienes. Okay, it enters into the pathway of 5 lipooxygenase pathway. Then first who is produced? Leukotriene A4 is produced. A4 is produced. So this leukotriene A4, now if it is acted upon by an enzyme called as leukotriene C4 synthase, who is going to be produced? Leukotriene C4. C4 will be converted into D4. D4, D4 will be converted into E4. Okay. Now, if this leukotriene A4, if it is acted upon by an enzyme called as leukotriene A4 hydrolase. Okay, leukotriene A4 hydro Lays, then which leukotriene is going to be produced? Leukotriene B4 is going to be produced. This is how LTB4 is produced. Leukotriene B4. Okay, so this is how the leukotrienes are produced. One point I want you to know is, so this leukotriene B4 is also going to be helpful in chemo attractant. It's also a chemo attractant, sir. It is also going to recruit the neutrophils. So it is also helping in chemo taxes. It's helping in the chemo taxes. Done? Now, look, if this arachidonic acid, if it is acted upon by 12 lipooxygenase, if it is acted upon by 12 lipooxygenase, what will happen? Now, lipoxins, lipoxins are produced, sir, okay? Lipoxin A4, okay? Lipoxin XA4, lipoxin XB4. These are the substances which are produced, okay? So, 12 lipooxygenase, if it is entering into the pathway of 12 lipoxygenase, then lipoxins are produced. Remember, these lipoxins, they are anti-inflammatory. Okay, they are anti-inflammatory, sir. Okay, these lipoxins are anti-inflammatory. So, this is how the leukotrienes are produced. The important point about them is, uh, these leukotrienes, they go. These leukotrienes, not only this, this also. These are, they are the potent, right, potent bronchoconstrictors. They are the potent bronchoconstrictors. They will cause bronchoconstriction. They are the potent bronchoconstrictors, sir. Okay? Yeah. Completed. Okay, they are the potent bronchoconstrictors. So, with this, what we have completed? We have completed everything. See, arachidonic acid, it is going into the pathway of cyclooxygenase and it is going into the pathway of lipooxygenase. So, we have seen the prostaglandin synthesis as well as leukotriene synthesis. Completed. Okay, those two are the ones which will come in your exams. So, look. See, we have discussed about 
what we have discussed about nitric oxide all arachidonic acid metabolites we have discussed chemokines completed cytokines completed we have discussed about the platelet activating factor and reactive oxygen species means you know it okay they are the free radicals okay anyway there is not nothing to discuss uh, specific about them now what we have completed at the end of the day we have completed all the cell derived inflammatory mediators the preformed cell uh, the preformed mediators as well as the newly synthesized mediators so what we are left with what we are left with sir we are left with plasma derived things okay plasma derived things sir okay we are derived with, we are left with the plasma derived things we have completed the arachidonic acid metabolites now what we have discussed we have to discuss the complement system okay now let's begin with the complement system right complement system most of the students they will confuse between complement system and coagulation cascade complement system is totally different thing it's a immune thing okay it's a immune thing there are certain proteins in your plasma sir which are called as a complement proteins these are the complement proteins c1 c2 c3 c4 c5 c6 c7 c8 c9 there are this complement proteins present whenever there is an infection this complement proteins are activated once the complement proteins are activated they will start to kill the organisms they will kill the bacteria okay so complement system it's a more kind of immune thing clotting is different okay clotting is different they are going to form the blood, like you know clot to prevent the blood loss okay now in this complement system what i want you to know take you guys here in this image you can clearly see so the complement system see the complement system it can be activated by three pathways there are three pathways with which the complement system is activated so what are these three pathways take you classical pathway alternate pathway and there is also one more pathway called as a lectin pathway okay mannose binding lectin pathway so for your exams mainly you need to know about the classical pathway and alternate pathway sir mainly the two important pathways by which the complement systems are getting activated now first itself i am telling you see first itself i am telling you once the complement system is activated at the end of the day dekho sir complements are getting activated there is something called as c3 convertase c5 convertase at the end of the day look C5B to C9, C5B to C9. Do you know what is the C5B to C9? I will tell you in detail, one by one. We will go. Do you know what is the C5B to C9, sir? This is something called as MAC, membrane attack complex. At the end of the day, once the complement system is activated, it doesn't matter whether it is by classical pathway or alternate pathway. It doesn't matter. At the end of the day, who is going to be produced? Membrane attack complex is going to be produced. This membrane attack complex is going to cause cell lysis. cell death which is cell death bacterial death okay it's going to cause it's going to kill the bacteria it's going to kill the microbes okay so this is the point which i want you to know so complement system it is activated by three pathways first right one by one it's activated by how many pathways classical pathway classical pathway the second pathway is alternate pathway okay alternate pathway and the third pathway is lectin pathway okay mannose binding lectin pathway mannose binding lectin okay mannose binding lectin pathway okay these are the three pathways so at the end of the day because of the activation of this okay complements are activated sir at the end of the day who is going to be formed membrane attack complex will be formed so what exactly is membrane attack complex c5b2 9 okay c5b to c9 okay c5b to c9 sir you will you will get it out sir what is the c5b to c9 sir don't worry i will explain you okay these are the complement proteins so these complement proteins are going to form the membrane attack complex this membrane attack complex puts pore sir it's like a drilling machine this membrane attack complex is like a drilling machine it puts holes into the cell membrane of the bacteria so that what happens now more and more water will go into the bacteria the bacteria is going to become swollen it's going to be like in a total water balloon it's going to burst away right so this membrane attack complex it will put holes in cell membranes okay it's going to put the cell holes in the cell membrane so because of that the bacteria will swell swell i will show everything and it's going to be killed it's going to be killed sir so now having said that first let's begin from the basics okay let's begin from the basics so what is a complement pathway right complement okay complement pathway but 
let me show you the diagram once in between some important things are there they go complement pathway sir okay complement system the classical pathway first time going to discuss about the classical pathway okay not complement pathway sorry the classical pathway okay classical pathway now in the middle in our journey in our journey what we will see is we will encounter the word c3 converters we will encounter the word c5 converters okay just i am telling you okay in the the topic now we are going to discuss that sir classical pathway is going to activate c3 converters c3 converters after c5 converters at the end of the day mac is going to be produced okay just showing you okay now let's take the bacteria sir now we have to draw the bacteria now let's the bacteria see this is the bacteria the bad guy now he is very sad sir now he is very sad okay he is very sad do you know why because we are going to kill him how by the classical pathway so what exactly is classical pathway sir classical pathway it is activated by igg and IgM antibodies, GM. I used to remember something like you know there is a famous mnemonic, GM, General Motors. You know right, the General Motors which makes the cars in the foreign countries, General Motors mainly in the US. General Motors makes classical cars. General Motors make the classical cars. I have read it, like you know it's a, a very famous mnemonic from a very great teacher. So the classical pathway is going to be activated. The classical pathway is going to be activated because of this. Anti, like you know these antibodies. Now, where are these antibodies, sir? Now, these antibodies, they go. Now, these antibodies, they are bonding with the antigen. See, now this is the antibody. Which antibody? IgG antibody or IgM antibody. Okay, IgG antibody or IgM antibody. Now, they came and now they are binding with the antigen. Okay, now they are binding with the antigen on the bacterial surface. Now, do you know what it will do? Now, this antigen antibody complex, now this antibody is going to activate the complement proteins. Where are, where are the complement proteins present? So the complement proteins are present in our plasma. There are many, many complement proteins present in the plasma, sir. Okay. Now these complement proteins are going to be activated. These complement proteins, they will also come into the tissue. Because of the leakage, even these complement proteins came into the tissue, sir. Now they go, what happens? Sir, this IgG antibody or IgM antibody, first what it will do is it will activate the complement number 1. Okay, it's activating the complement number 1, C1. Okay, now what this C1 will do? Actually, this is C1Q, but anyway, it is activating the complement number 1, protein number 1. So, this C1, now it is going to activate complement number 2 and 4. Okay, complement number 2 and complement number 4. So, previously, these complements are inactive. They are always sleeping, sir. The complements are sleeping. Now, let me tell you one thing. Once, for example, if this is C1, okay, if you activate the C1, it is going to be converted into C1A and C1, B. It is going to split into two parts. Same thing. If you activate, see, see, this is C2. Imagine this is C2. It is inactive, sir. If you activate it, it is going to split into two parts. C2, A and C2, B. Same with C5 also. C3, C4. Same with everyone. Once you activate an inactive complement protein. See, these are the inactive complement proteins. Once you cleave them, now, once you activate them, they are going to cleave into C1A, C1B, C2A, C2B, C3A, C4B, C4A, C5A, something like that. Okay. Now, what you are doing? Sir, this antigen antibody complex, this antigen antibody complex along with the C1, what it is going to do? Sir, it is going to activate which complements? C2, C4. Now, C2, C4 are activated, sir. Now, they will be converted into what? Now, they will be converted into C2A, C2B, C4A, C4B. Now, I am only taking C, this C4B, now C4B and C2A, these subunits I am taking, now they will bind, now they are going to be called as, now they are called as the C4B, C2A, now the C4B, C2A, now this molecule it is called as C3 convertase. Okay, now you understood what is C3 convertase? So, C3 convertase is nothing but these activated complements. This activated complement, sir, C4B, C2A, now together it is working as an enzyme. It is going to work as an enzyme. What is the enzyme name? The enzyme name is called as C3 convertase. The name itself is there. What it is doing? It is going to convert inactive C3 into active C3. So, what is going to happen? Look, sir, the inactive C3, 
is converted into active C3 that is C3A, C4B. Okay, C3A, C4B. Okay, now it is going to be converted into C3A, sir, plus C4B. Now, here we are taking this 3B, sir. Now, we are going to take this. Okay, now we are going to take C3A and, sorry, now just clear this C3A and C3B. Okay, C3A, C3B. Now, we are going to take this 3B. Now, we are going to take this 3B, sir. Now, right, this 3B, now the same thing. Okay, now the same thing. C4B, 2A, 3B. Same, this 2A. Okay, I am talking about this 2A, sir. Now, C4B, 2A, this 3B, this 3B, C3B. Now, they all will fuse. Now, they all will act like an enzyme again. The C3B is coming and binding, sir. Now, this molecule, this C4B, 2A, 3B. Okay, the C4B, 2A, 3B. This molecule is called as, now, C5 convertase. C5 convertase means what? It's going to activate C5, C5. Already we have C. We have activated C1. C1 activated, C2 activated, C3 activated, C4 activated. Everything is activated, sir. Okay. Now, this C5 convertase, do you know what it will do? The C5 convertase. Now, it is going to convert inactive C5. See, they go, for example, now, the inactive C5, sir, so this is inactive C5. It is converted into C5A and C5B. Now, this is our hero. The hero is the C5B, sir. This C5B is the hero. Once C5B is activated, do you know what it will do? It will activate C6, C7, C8, C9. So, now the C5B, it is going to fuse with, it is going to fuse with C6, C7, C8, C9. Okay. So, C3, C5B, C6, C7, C8, C9. Now, all of them, they will fuse. Now, all of them, they will fuse, sir. Now, this is a drilling mission now. Now, this is a drilling mission. Now, it is going to form what? This is going to, they will all fuse and they are going to form a channel kind of thing, which is called as membrane attack complex. Now, this is the membrane attack complex. Now, tell me, what exactly is membrane attack complex made up of? The membrane attack complex is made up of C5B, C6, C7, C8, C9. So, C5B to C9, C5B to C9, this is called as membrane attack complex. Do you know what this membrane attack complex is going to do? Now, it's like a drilling machine. Now, it will put holes. Now, this, this is the membrane attack complex. Now, it's going to put holes, sir. Thousands and thousands of membrane attack complex are going to be produced. See, now, everywhere holes in the cell membrane. Now, through these holes, what happens? Now, water will start to enter into the cell. Okay, water will start to enter into the cell. So, bacteria will become swollen. Now, bacteria is becoming like a water balloon. Now it will swell, swell, swell and it will burst away. The bacteria will be killed, sir. Killed. So this is the classical pathway, sir. The classical pathway. Okay. In the classical pathway, what they will ask in your exam is the questions. What is the C3 convertase and what is the C5 convertase? C3 convertase is what? C3 convertase is C4B and C2A. C4B and C2A is the C3 convertase. And what is the C5 convertase? C4B, C2A and 3B. C4B, 2A, 3B. Which means C4B. C2A, C3B, all these molecules together, they work like an enzyme, C5 convertase, converts inactive C5 into active C5. So, the C5, the C5B component, C5B component is going to fuse with C6, C7, C8, C9, they form a membrane attack complex, they are going to form a pore, they will drill, sir, they will put the drills into, they will put the holes into the cell membrane, or the bacteria, and they will kill the bacteria, right? So, classical pathway is completed, classical pathway is completed, sir, okay? Now, after this, small pathway, okay, after this, let's discuss about the alternate pathway, okay, now let's discuss about alternate pathway. Okay, alternate pathway. So, what you need to know regarding the alternate pathway, again, let's take the same thing, same bacteria, sir, again, the bacteria is very sad. Okay, why the bacteria is sad? Because it's going to be killed. It's going to be killed. How, sir? Now, this alternate pathway is acted upon by, again, antibody. Okay, again, antibody. But it's a different antibody now. It is Ig antibody. Okay, now I'm taking Iga antibody. 
Now this Ig antibody, what it will do? Sir, now this Ig antibody, see this is the antigen. Now this antigen antibody complex, right? Now the antibody is binding to the antigen. Now this Ig antibody it is going to activate C3. Okay, it's going to activate C3, complement protein C3. So C3 will be converted into C3 and C3B. Now let's talk about the C. 3B. Now C3B is activated. Sorry, so C3 is activated. So C3 is converted into C3A and C3B. Now this is a C3B. Now what this C3B will do? So C3B is going to bind with something called as factor 3. Factor 3, sir. Okay, these are different things. These are not the complement proteins. These are the factor 3. There is a something called as a factor 3. Now when C3B is acting on factor B. See, normally factor B is also inactive. Factor B, it's inactive. Now this C3B, it acts on factor B so that factor B is also going to be converted into, okay, this factor B. So this is a factor B. Factor B is going to be converted into BA and BB. Okay, so two components will come, right? Factor B is inactive. So factor B when it is activated, factor BA and factor BB will come. Okay, so now what happens is, so look, so this C3B, it is act, it's acting on factor B. Now when it is acting on factor B, who will come? See, now B, B is there. B A gone, B A gone. B, B is there. Now this is active. Now this C3B binds with this B, B. C3B is going to bind with this B, B. Okay, this is MCQ, sir. C3B, B, B. Now this C3B, B, B is called as C3 convertase. Now this is what? This is C3 convertase. Now C3 convertase is produced. Now in alternate pathway, the C3 convertase, write me right first here, this is C3 convertase. Okay, now in alternate pathway, C3 convertase is different. In classical pathway, they go, this is C3 convertase, sir. The C3 convertase is C4B, C2A. Okay, C4, C4B, 2A. C4B, 2A. C4B, 2A. Just forget about the C. C4B, 2A. That's the C3 convertase. In alternate pathway, what is happening? Ig antibody first activates the C3. C3 is going to be cleaved into C3A, C3B. Now here C3B came. Now the C3B is going to react with the factor B. Factor B is activated. So factor B is going to be split into BA and BB. Forget about the BA. Now we are talking about the BB. Now the C3B is going to bind with BB. Now this is called as C3 convertase. Now what it will do? So what it will do, sir? It will convert C3. Again, new, this is a new C3 molecule. The C3 will be converted into C3A. And C3B, okay, C3A and C3B, okay, C3A and C3B. Now, again, you are going to take this C3B, okay. Now, B are important, sir. Now, here again, we are going to take this C3B. Now, what happens? See, the same this is coming, sir. Now, C3B, BB, and now this C3B, now this 3B, now this 3B, okay. Now they are going to fuse, now they are going to fuse, and now they will act like an enzyme. Now, which enzymes are this one? This is your C5 convertase. Now, this is your C5 convertase. Now, this is your C5 convertase. Now, what the C5 convertase will do? Sir, now the C5 convertase is going to convert inactive C5 into, now the C5 convertase, what it will do? Now, it will convert C5, complement protein number 5, into C5A and C5B. Now hero came, sir. Now this is the hero. C5B is the hero. Now I told you. Whenever C5B comes, C5B is going to bind with C6, 7, 8, 9. What it will form? C5 to C9. C5B to C9. Now they are going to form what? Now they are going to form membrane attack complex. Okay, now they are going to form the membrane attack complex. What a MAC will do? Membrane attack complex. It is going to put holes in the cell. Now the cell is Sir, dying because now it is keeping lots and lots of drills, sir, into the cell. So what happens? Water will come into the cell. Now the cell will become swollen and the cell will be ruptured, blast away. So this is the alternate pathway, sir. This is how the alternate pathway works. At the end of the day, at the end of the day, doesn't matter whether it is classical pathway or alternate pathway or lectin, lectin pathway. Okay, man was binding lectin pathway. At the end of the day, who should be produced? It's a membrane attack complex. The membrane attack complex should be produced. The membrane attack complex is from C3, sorry, C5B to C9. The, what the membrane attack complex is doing? It will put, it will, it will drill the holes into the 
cell membrane causing the cell, cell to swell and blast away the bacteria is dead cell. So I have discussed about the classical pathway as well as alternate pathway. Done. Okay, classical pathway as well as alternate pathway are done. Now some important questions, direct questions which will come in your exam is, Sir, complement system, is it good or bad? Just tell me. Sir, complement system is good. It is killing the bacteria. It is killing the bacteria, helping in the inflammation. Okay. Now, most common complement deficiency. Most common complement deficiency, sir. The most common complement deficiency is C2. Okay, question. Now, membrane attack complex. Just tell me, membrane attack complex is from C5 to C5B to C9. Okay, C5B to C9 forms the membrane attack complex. Now, chemo tactic agents. Chemo taxis. Okay, who are going to help you in the chemo taxis? See, during this classical pathway, should, look at here, during this classical pathway and alternate pathway, what we have produced, sir, Deco? we have produced the C5A, right? C5A. What is the function of the C5A? Now, here also see, we have produced the C5A. Sir, the C5A, it recruits more and more neutrophils to the area of inflammation. So, C5A is a chemotactic agent, C5A, sir. Okay, C5A is the chemotactic agents. Now, what are opsonins? What are opsonins which are produced? Uh, what are the what are the opsonins which are produced uh, during this uh, complement activation? Complement activation. See, during this pathway, we have produced the C3B, right? See, this C3B molecule is getting produced. See, this C3B molecule, guys, listen. This C3B molecule and C4B, C5B, all Bs, Bs. C3B, C4B, C5B, especially the C3B, sir, important. So the C3B molecule, it will also act like an opsonin. You know, right, opsonin. Opsonin means like a decoration, decorating the bacteria so that more and more macrophages will come and eat the bacteria. Okay, so the C3B molecule, they will go and fall on the bacteria so that now macrophages will easily recognize the bacteria and do the phagocytosis. So the C3B molecule, C3B, C4B, C5B, all these are opsonins. Okay, all these are the opsonins. Now, there are certain deficiencies, there are certain diseases where the complement proteins will, under, will be deficient. Okay, for example, if membrane attack complex, MAC, if the membrane attack complex, if it is deficient, if it is not forming, okay, that will cause what? That will cause recurrent capsulated organism infections. Capsulated infections with capsulated organisms. Okay, infections with the capsulated organisms, especially which organism? Neisseria. Neisseria gonorrhea. Okay, so Neisseria gonorrheal infections, sir. Okay, Neisseria infections will occur. Okay, Neisseria infections will occur, sir. MAC deficiency. Okay, now normally unnecessarily, unnecessarily complements are not supposed to be activated, sir. Okay, unnecessarily complements are not supposed to be activated. Once if they are activated, again they need to be inactivated. There is something called as C1 inhibitor. C1 inhibitor. Means the C1 inhibitor is inhibiting the complements. It's inhibiting the complements. Unnecessarily, we don't want the complements, sir. Now, if this C1 inhibitor, if it is deficient, question asked, it is going to cause angioedema. Okay, it's going to cause what? Angioedema, sir. So, complement number C124. Complement number 1, complement number 2, complement number 4. If they are deficient, it's going to cause SLE. Okay, it's seen in SLE, sir. Okay, it's seen in SLE. So, these are some important MCQs which I want you to know. Especially, this is a question which was asked. C1 inhibitor, C1 inhibitor deficiency is going to cause angioedema. Membrane attack complex, that is C5B2, C9 deficiency is going to cause recurrent infections with the capsulated organisms, especially Neisseria infections, okay, Neisseria meningitis infections. Now, opsonin, sir, C3B, chemotactic agent is C5A, MAC is from C5B to C9, and most common complement deficiency is C2. So, with this, complement system is also completed. The clotting cascade will be discussed different, uh, separately in the hemodynamics, like, you know, in the vascular pathology, in the vascular pathology, I will discuss about the, uh, the clotting. Now, with this, the entire the inflammatory mediator, sir. Okay, such a big topic, entire inflammatory mediator, sir, completed. Now, let's begin with the chronic inflammation and let's see what are the important topics which you need to know for your exam. And also, uh, let's discuss about some important points about the wound healing also, right? So, this will be more than enough, sir. For your exam, this will be more than enough. Now, 
chronic inflammation. So tell me, guys, please tell me, chronic inflammation, what do you think? Is it going to be there for a short period of time or long period of time? Chronic inflammation, when you will see chronic inflammation. When you will see the chronic inflammation, is it a short-lived inflammation or prolonged inflammation? It's a prolonged inflammation, sir. It's not a short-lived. It's a prolonged, right? Prolonged. Prolonged. Inflammation, okay? So it will be there for weeks to months. It will be there for weeks to months. It's not a short-lived thing, okay? It's going to be there for weeks to months and even years also, right? And when you will have the chronic inflammation, first you will be having acute inflammation, okay, acute inflammation, that acute inflammation will be followed by chronic inflammation, okay. So, follows, follows acute inflammation. So, after acute inflammation, you are going to have the chronic inflammation, right. Now, what you will see here, so in chronic inflammation, what exactly is happening? See, what there is some injury happened, your tissues are trying to recover, see at the same time injury is happening, it's a long lived inflammation, there is injury happening, at the same time repair is also happening, so injury repair, injury repair, they are continuously happening, so inflammation is persistent, okay. So in this chronic inflammation, we need to understand there is tissue damage and that's one of the hallmark, okay, tissue damage is one of the hallmark of uh, chronic inflammation, tissue damage and repair occurs at the same time, okay. So, these are the three important points which I want you to know. It's a prolonged inflammation. It follows after the acute inflammation and tissue damage and repair are occurring at the same time. Now, let me ask you. So, first of all, what is the cause of this? Okay, what is the cause of this chronic inflammation? Causes, right. Okay, causes of this chronic inflammation. In which conditions? See, normally if I am having any small bone injury or some prick injury, I am not going to go into chronic inflammation. So, in which conditions there will be chronic inflammation? So, any idea, guys? See, if there is any persistent infection going on in the body, which, are, which my body cannot get rid of. See, there is some infection happening in my body, but my body defenses are not enough to get rid of that infection. So, continuously, Inflammation is happening. The inflammation is prolonged. It's continuously happening. So, what are the causes? The first cause is persistent infections. Okay. Persistent infections like TB. Okay. India, the persistent infections like TB. Okay. Because of the mycobacterium tuberculosis are autoimmune diseases. Okay. So, in autoimmune diseases, say for example, imagine there is this one person who is having the systemic lupus erythematosus. Now, do you think systemic lupus erythematosus is going to be there for just 3-4 days? It's going to be there for just a short period of time? No, it's going to be there for years together. So, years together, the inflammation is happening in the joints, in rheumatoid arthritis. Okay, if there is rheumatoid arthritis, autoimmune disease, the inflammation will carry on for years together. So, that's a chronic inflammation, not acute inflammation. Okay, so chronic inflammation can be a result of autoimmune diseases, persistent infections, okay, or if you are uh, exposed to certain things like prolonged exposure, prolonged exposure, so prolonged exposure to what, for example, your occupation, as your occupation, you are, you are getting prolonged exposure to silica, okay. Okay, so the silica particles are going to be deposited into your lungs. You cannot get rid of the silica. Your body cannot get rid of the silica. So continuously, continuously, your body's immune system is trying to remove that, but you, your body cannot remove that. Okay, so continuously there is inflammation is there. Okay, continuous inflammation is there. Okay, so these are some important causes I am telling you. Okay, even in cancers there will be chronic inflammations will be seen. So persistent infections or autoimmune diseases or prolonged exposure to certain types of chemicals can lead to chronic inflammation. Okay, now. After this, uh, for your exam, these are the general points. These are the general points. They won't come in your exam. Now, a question that will come in your exam is, then what is the important cell involved? Okay, what is the important cell that is involved in the chronic inflammation? Important cell. There are many cells involved, but important cell. Important cell involved in chronic inflammation. 
Okay. In acute inflammation, the king is neutrophil, sir. Okay. In acute inflammation topic, I have discussed, it is the neutrophils that dominate. Again, okay. the first three days, right? in the mainly in acute period. So, after that, who will come? In chronic inflammation, the most important cell is macrophage, sir. Okay. So, macrophages are the most important cells. Of course, lymphocytes are also there. Our lymphocytes are also involved in chronic inflammation. But, it is the macrophages who are the heroes. Okay. Now, my question to you. How many types of macrophages do you know? So, how many types of macrophages are there? There are two types of macrophages. Okay. There are two types of macrophages. One is type 1 macrophage. Okay, type 1 macrophage and type 2. Okay, type 1 macrophage, type 2. Uh, it's, uh, they're also called as M1. Type 1 is M1. Okay, let me write a better thing. M1. M1 macrophages. And M2 macrophages. Okay, type 1 and type 2. So, there are two types of macrophages present. Uh, this is something important for your exam. They will ask you, sir, what exactly is this type 1 doing? And what exactly is this type 2 doing? Okay, see, this type 1 macrophages and type 2 macrophages which are seen during chronic inflammation, first of all, they, will, they need to be activated, sir. Normal macrophage need to be converted into M1 and M2 type. So, how you will get this M1 macrophages? How? See, there is a pathway called as a classical pathway. Okay, in the topic of complement system in the last class, okay, in yesterday's class I have discussed, there is classical pathway for the complement activation, there is alternate pathway for the complement activation. In the same way, even these macrophages, they will also be activated because of two pathways. The normal macrophage will be activated because of two pathways. Do you know what are they? Classical pathway, same. Alternate pathway. Classical pathway will result in, see, because of this classical pathway, I will explain you. Because of this classical pathway, you will get M1 type of macrophages. Because of alternate pathway, okay, because of this alternate pathway, you will get this M2 type of macrophages. Okay, this is the MCQ. Okay, classical pathway will result in the production of M1 type of macrophages. Alternate pathway will result in M2 macrophages. Now, you will get it out. Sir, what is this classical pathway and what is this alternate pathway? And there, no, I will explain here. So, classical pathway, right? Classical pathway. So, what exactly is this classical pathway telling you? See, for example, now, this classical pathway, it is activated by, see, for example, now you got some infection into your body, okay, some microbe is there, okay, some microbe is there, sir, so this microbe, it is producing some introtoxin, okay, so what it is producing, it is producing some toxin, it is producing some, sir, not introtoxin, endotoxin, sir, okay, endotoxin, okay, so this microbe, it is producing this endotoxin, sir. Okay, well and good. So, now this endotoxins, okay, these materials, these are like antigens, right? Now, these endotoxins, which are coming from the bacteria, now, where they will go and bind? So, here, they go, this is the macrophage, this is our hero, okay? So, this is our macrophage, is our hero. Now, on the surface of these macrophages, there are receptors present called as a tall-like receptors, okay, tall-like receptors, TLRs. Okay, TLRs. On the surface of the macrophage, what do we have? Tall-like receptors. Now, this endotoxins, okay, now this endotoxins, now they will come and stimulate the tall-like receptor. Okay, now macrophage is going to bind with this endotoxins. Now, macrophage is activated. So, now macrophage, what it is doing? Now, it is activated, sir. Now, do you know what this macrophage will do? Now, macrophage is telling to the T-cells. Are the T-cells? There is some bacteria came into the body, informing to the T-cells, higher authority. Now, this macrophage, right, what it is doing? Sir, it activates what? It activates T-cells. Now, T-cells understood that there is something wrong in the body. Now, it is giving the signal to the macrophages. Okay? Now, T-cells are like the Prime Minister. Now, he is giving the command. Okay, macrophages, you get activate. Okay, you get activated and kill that microbe. Okay? So, these macrophages are like army. This army is reporting to the center that there is some problem happening in the body. Okay, now this T-cells, they go, now what it is producing? Sir, now these T-cells are going to produce interferon gamma. Okay, interferon gamma. Now this interferon gamma is going to activate these macrophages. Into which type of macrophages? Into M1 type of macrophages. Now, see this interferon gamma is going to act on the macrophages. Now these are M1 type of macrophages. Now, do you know what they will do? 
Now these macrophages, come on guys. Now these macrophages, they are going to produce reactive oxygen species. Why? To kill that microbe. Now reactive oxygen species. Okay, reactive oxygen species are going to be produced. And now these macrophages, they will also release lots of cytokines. Okay, lots of cytokines. Why? This See, this reactive oxygen species and the cytokines, these are the ones which are going to cause the chronic inflammation. Okay, inflammation. So, now what I am trying to put into your mind is, see, now here what you have seen, this is the classical pathway. So, what exactly is classical pathway? You will study this in your microbiology also. So, what exactly is this classical pathway? In classical pathway, it is the microbial endotoxins. Okay, it is the microbial endotoxins that the bacteria is activating the macrophage. Now, these macrophages are going to give signal to the T cells. Now, T cells produce the interferon gamma. Okay, uh, uh, the interferon gamma. Now, this interferon gamma is coming and acting again. Now, again, the T cell is communicating back to the macrophage. So, now these macrophages are activated. Okay, now these macrophages are activated. Now, these macrophages are going to produce the cytokines as well as the reactive oxygen species. That's the, that those reactive oxygen species are going to kill the microbe. So, this is the classical pathway. Now, after this classical pathway, now let us discuss about the alternate pathway. Alternate pathway. Right? So, what exactly happens in alternate, alternate pathway? You know it. Okay? See, in alternate pathway, you are going to have M2 type of macrophages. Okay? M2 type of macrophages. Now, what is this alternate pathway, sir? See, alternate pathway, now it starts with the T cells. T cells. Now, what these T cells are producing? Because now these T cells, they are producing cytokines other than interferon gamma. For example, now see, they are producing cytokines. Here also see, here also T cells produce the cytokine. Interferon gamma is one of that cytokine. Okay. Now, here the T cells are producing the cytokine other than. Other than what? Other than interferon gamma. Okay. Other than interferon gamma. Now, which cytokine, sir? For example, see, if you ask me which cytokine, sir, inter interleukin 4, interleukin 13. Now, what they are going to do? Now, they are going to act on the macrophages. Okay, now they are going to act on the macrophages. Now, what these macrophages are going to do? Now, these macrophages, when they are acted upon by, see, when they are acted upon by this interleukins, this type of interleukins, now they will become M2 macrophages. Okay, now they become M2 macrophages. Now, why we are calling them as M2 macrophages? Sir? What they exactly do? So, are they going to produce a reactive oxygen species? Are they going to produce the cytokines which will lead to inflammation? No, that's a big no, sir. Now, what these macrophages will do is, they will try to stop the inflammation. Enough, inflammation, enough. There is no need of further inflammation. Now, repair. Now, healing. Now, healing should start. Okay. So, M1 type of macrophages are pro-inflammatory, they will, they, will, they will continue the inflammation. Now, this M2 type of macrophages, they are more helping in the tissue repair. Okay, they are more helping in the tissue repair. Inflammation completed, now it's a time to repair. Okay, so now M2 macrophages, what they will do is, first right, they will inhibit, okay, they will inhibit classical pathway. Okay, they will inhibit the classical pathway. Not only that, they will help in tissue repair. Okay, they will, they will help in tissue repair. Okay, next, what else? They will help in the production of growth factors. Like vascular endothelial growth factor helps in angiogenesis. Okay, so now, Tell me, so what exactly is type 1 macrophage and what exactly is type 2 macrophage? See, the, the differentiation is based on their function. Type 1 macrophages or M1 macrophages are more helping in the inflammatory process. They are more helping in the inflammatory process. Type 2 macrophages are this M2 macrophages, they are more helping in the tissue repair. This is a very important point. This is the MCQ. M2 helps in tissue repair, stopping the inflammation, sir. Okay. So, these are the points which I want you to know. Okay. Now, we have seen about the macrophages. Now, after this, let's talk about that. We have seen two different types of macrophages. Let's discuss more about the macrophages because the macrophages are our hero, right? Now, different types of macrophages in the body. Different types of macrophages. Okay. 
Okay. Now you understand. Okay. So, Tom Cruise, hope you are doing good. Okay. I have seen you after a long time. I think I have. I'm seeing you, Tom Cruise. Okay. Anyway, different types of macrophages. Now, so there are macrophages in the skin. There are macrophages in the brain. Yes. There are macrophages in the skin. There are macrophages in the brain. There are macrophages in the bone. There are macrophages in different different parts of the body. Okay, placenta. There are macrophages <coughs> in spleen. Okay. Yeah. Now let's see what are the different types of macrophages in the body. Okay, what are the different types of macrophages in the body? Now skin may. So what are the type of macrophages in the skin? In the skin, skin. What is the type of, there is this macrophage or the antigen presenting skin in the skin, sir. It is called as Langer, yes. Langer hands cells, Langer hand cells. In the brain, they are called as microglia. Okay, microglial cells. The microglial cells are nothing but the macrophages in the brain. What are the macrophages in the bone? Osteoclasts. What are the macrophages in the placenta called as? Half bar. Half bar cells. Okay, half bar cells. Now, in the spleen, the macrophages are called as littoral cells. So, for your exam, is this important? Very much important. In the lung, they are called as anyone? In the lung, in the lung. In the liver, they are called as? In the liver, they are called as? Okay, cover cells. In the lung, they are called as dust cells. Okay, or alveolar macrophages. So, here what we have discussed is there are different types of macrophages. There are different types of macrophages in our body. I shouldn't say different types of macrophages, the same macrophages in different different organs, they are called with the different different names. My question to you, my question to you, sir, macrophages, what exactly are they? Macrophages are they, no? What exactly are they? They are derived from which cells? Macrophages are derived from which cells? So, these macrophages, they are derived from which blood cell? Monocytes. Okay, they are derived from monocytes. So, once the monocytes, when they enter into the tissues, once the monocytes, they enter into the tissues, now they are called as macrophages. Okay. So, these are some macrophages which I want you to know. Now, after this, shall we begin with the chronic inflammation? We will begin with the chronic inflammation important points. See, in this chronic inflammation, if you look at the microscope, imagine there is this chronic inflammation going on in my body. Okay, continuous infection, persistent infection is happening, maybe in this area, for example, imagine there is a persistent infection happening in this area. Now, if you take a biopsy, okay, if you take a biopsy and if you put it under the microscope, in the area of chronic inflammation, what you will see is granulomas. Not every time, but yes, granulomas are seen. See, granulomas, these are the histological features. So, granulomas are seen. So, it is called as granulomatous inflammation. So, granulomatous inflammation is a type of chronic inflammation. It is a type of chronic inflammation. Now, my question to you is, which interleukin, okay, which interleukin, go to the last class, okay, think, like, you know, think, what we have discussed in the last class, sir, which interleukin, uh, which interferon is going to help in granuloma formation, which interferon, granuloma formation, G, granuloma for G, interferon gamma, okay, interferon gamma, okay, interferon gamma helps in the production of granulomas. Okay. Now, what exactly, what the hell is this granuloma, sir? Okay. What the hell is this granuloma? Now, let me show you a name. Uh, first, let me write and later I will show you the image. The granulomas, they consist of, see, inflammation is happening, right? So, some amount of necrosis is happening. So, some amount of necrosis is happening. So, cells are dying. Okay. So, necrotic debris is there. So, there is area of central caseous necrosis. Okay, there is an area of necrosis. Okay, there is an area of central necrosis, caseous necrosis. Means, in the center of the granuloma, there is a necrotic debris. Okay, next, what else, sir? Macrophages are there. These are our heroes. Macrophages are there. And there are epithelioid cells. Epithelioid cells. Next, Multinucleate giant cells. Okay, there are multinucleate giant cells. Okay, and last final thing, 
final thing at the periphery at the periphery you are going to have lymphocytes okay at the periphery you are going to have the lymphocytes so what exactly is a granuloma so let me tell you in a simple way see granuloma is a focus it's a focus of chronic inflammation it's a focus of chronic inflammation surrounded by macrophages in a simple way so it's a focus okay it's a focus of the chronic inflammation surrounded by the macrophages now you'll get it out sir okay macrophage is okay this area of necrosis is also okay some some amount of tissue damage is happening sir so necrosis is also okay macrophage is also okay then what are these epithelioid cells what the hell are these epithelioid cells sir okay what are these epithelioid cells epithelioid cells they are nothing but the macrophages they are the modified macrophages okay they are the modified macrophages okay epithelioid cells are nothing but the modified macrophages I will show you. Okay, they are modified macrophages. Right? Now, here, look at here. So, here what you are looking is a granuloma. This is a granuloma, sir. What you are looking in a granuloma, I have explained you. Sir, the granuloma in the center, look, in the center, what you are having? See, there is this pink color area of necrosis. Okay, necrotic debris. So, some, some kind of necrosis is happening, some bacteria will be there. So, in that area, cells are dying and there is a necrotic focus. There is a necrotic focus. Now, surrounding the necrotic focus, what do you have? Sir, you are having this elongated cells. Okay, this elongated slipper like cells. Okay, so look, you can look here. So, these are elongated cells. These elongated cells are called as epithelioid cells. These are called as epithelioid cells. Okay. Okay, epithelioid cells, done sir. Now, not only epithelioid cells, you can see there is this one cell, okay, there is this one cell with multiple nuclei, one cell with multiple nuclei, these are called as multinucleate giant cells, multinucleate giant cells, yeah, okay, this, this one, multinucleate giant cells, MGC, multinucleate giant cell, okay, and last, finally, who do we, uh, who are there, are you able to appreciate this blue color cells in the periphery? So, these blue color cells which are there in the periphery, they are called as lymphocytic color, sir. That's a lymphocytic color, okay. See, clusters of epithelioid cells, okay. Epithelioid cells are there, okay. Surrounded by lymphocytes. There's a cluster of epithelioid cell that is surrounded by the lymphocytes. Actually, these are the lymphocytes. They are forming a periphery, like a boundary, okay. So, lymphocytes are also completed. My question to you, my question to you. Sir, which type of lymphocytes are these? So, there are lymphocytes, okay. There are different types of lymphocytes, right? T helper cells, T helper 1, T helper 2, T uh, cytotoxic cells, you know it. So, which type of lymphocytes? T helper 1 lymphocytes. Okay, these are mainly T helper 1 lymphocytes, sir. Okay. Of course, some amount of B lymphocytes will also be there, but mainly T lymphocytes. Okay. So, now tell me, so what exactly is a granuloma? First, relax and let's go one by one. So what exactly is a granuloma, sir? Granuloma is an area of chronic inflammation where there is a central necrotic area, okay, the, where there is central area of caseous necrosis, okay. So this area, this pink color area, necrotic area, it is surrounded by macrophages, epithelioid cells and multinucleate giant cells. Now, what are epithelioid cells? I have explained you. Sir, epithelioid cells, they are nothing but the modified macrophages. They are, they are the macrophages. So, the important point is what? They are elongated. Okay, they are elongated cells. Okay, they are elongated cells. Okay. So, which shape? Slipper shape. Okay, slipper shape. They are the shape of slipper. Okay. Nucleus in the shape of the slipper cell. Okay, slipper shaped. Now, what are these multinucleate giant cells? So, multinucleate giant cells means try to understand something like this. Now, there is some attack happening on you. Okay, there is some atta attack happening on you. You are trying to defend yourself. You are trying to defend yourself. You are trying to counter attack. But you cannot do it. So, what you are going to do? You are going to call your friends. You are going to call your backup. So, all of you together going to attack the opposite person. In the same way, now, whenever there is continuous inflammation, chronic, chronic inflammation, now some of the macrophages, these macrophages, they will start to fuse. So the macrophages are fused so that now 
in one macrophage, they, now it's become one single cell with multiple nuclei. Okay, multiple macrophages, multiple, multiple macrophages, they are fused. Now it became one cell with multiple number of nuclei. Okay, these are called as multinucleated giant cells. They are fused macrophages. They are nothing but fused macrophages. Okay, so multinucleated giant cells are nothing but the fused macrophages. And lymphocytes, what is the important point about the lymphocytes? Lymphocytes are T helper 1 cells. Now what these lymphocytes are doing? So these lymphocytes are forming what? They are forming lymphocytic collar. So they are forming what? Lymphocyte collar. Now, one important question which is um, important for your exam is, sir, okay, granulomas are going to have this lymphocytic collar. But there are certain granulomas, okay, in certain diseases, granulomas are there without this collar. Okay, so this lymphocytic collar is absent in. Absent in. Which condition? Sarcoidosis. Okay, it's the lymphocytic collars are absent in sarcoid granulomas. Okay, in sarcoidosis also granulomas are going to be seen. But those granulomas don't have any lymphocytic collar. Okay, now those granulomas are called as naked. Okay, they don't, they don't, they don't, they don't have a proper dress now. Okay, there is no collar, naked granulomas. Okay, so this is the important point which you need to know for your exam. Naked granulomas are seen in sarcoidosis. Okay, the collar, the, the collar is formed by lymphocytes. Done. Now, after this, what else you should know for your exam? Okay, what else you should know for your exam? See, sir, we have discussed about the granulomas, okay. Which type of granuloma? Sir, now we have discussed about the caseating granuloma in the central area. In the central area, you can see there is necrosis, caseous necrosis is happening. Okay, necrosis is happening. Okay, good. Now, after this, for your exams, we have to discuss about, okay, this giant cells, sir, this multinucleated giant cells are there. There are some important points about this multinucleated giant cells. Okay, right. Multinucleated giant cells. Now tell me, what exactly are these multinucleated giant cells? This multinucleated giant cells are nothing but the fused macrophages. Okay, many macrophages they are fused and they became a one single cell with multiple nucleus. Now, for example, see. This is one cell with multiple nuclei. Okay, one cell with multiple nuclei. This is a multinucleated giant cell. In different, different diseases, in different, different chronic inflammations, different, different types of multinucleated giant cells are seen. Okay, in different, different conditions, different, different multinucleated giant cells, different names are there. That's it. Okay, different names are there. Okay, now, see, these multinucleated giant cells, Okay, multinucleated giant cells are seen. Okay, multinucleated giant cells are seen in physiological conditions. Okay, there are certain physiological conditions that generally in my body, right now in my body. Yes, multinucleated giant cells are seen. But multinucleated giant cells are also seen in pathological conditions. We'll discuss about that now. Now, physiological. Now, what are the physiological examples and what are the pathological examples? Pathological. So, what are the physiological, what are the physiological examples of this multinucleated giant cells? Okay, see in my body, there are osteoclast. Okay, now you know osteoclast is what? Osteoclast is nothing but a macrophage in the bone. It's a macrophage in the bone. Okay, now if you look at an osteoclast, it's a multinucleated giant cell. There are many number of macrophages which are fused normally, in a normal person also. So that osteoclast it's a fused macrophage, sir. It's a, it's a, it's a giant cell. It's a multinucleated giant cell. Okay, and not only the macrophage in your bone marrow, there are mega karyocytes. Mega karyocytes. So these mega karyocytes are also examples of okay osteoclasts and mega karyocytes. They are physiological examples of multinucleated giant cells. Now, what are the pathological examples? Of multinucleated giant cells. In different different diseases, these multinucleated giant cells are called with different different names. Those are your MCQs. Okay, those are your MCQs. Pathological giant cells. Now write the first pathological giant cell. Okay, pathological giant cells. Now, can you name me? So, for example, let me show you this image. So, I'm showing you this image. Can you tell me what is this giant cell? So, they go. This is 
a giant cell. It's a multinucleated giant cell. Why I'm calling it as a multinucleated giant cell? You can very clearly see there are multiple, multiple nuclei present. Okay, there are multiple number of nuclei present. So it's a multinucleated giant cell. See in which condition? The first type. So this cell is called as Warthin Finkilde. No, 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 not in TB. This is Warthin Finkilde. These are the Warth and Finkilde giant cells. This is the famous question in the FMG exams, the favorite, favorite question in the FMG exam as well as an APG exam. Okay, Warth and Finkilde giant cells are seen in which condition? They are seen in measles. Okay, they are seen in, yes, they are seen in the measles condition. Okay, because of measles virus, if you are, if you are infected, if you are infected with this measles virus, Okay, if you are infected with this measles virus, it's going to cause a chronic inflammation so that in the body, the macrophages, they will fuse, they will fuse and becomes multinucleated giant cells. Now, these multinucleated giant cells are called as Parthen Fingilda giant cells are seen in measles. Now, my question to you, just I'm asking you, just try to recollect, if the patient is having measles infection, he's going to have some spots. There is a, there is a spot, there are spots which start with the letter K. In measles infection, the patient is going to have which spots? That's also a favorite question in the FMG exam. If the patient is having measles infection, he's going to have, yes, coplic spots. Okay, coplic spots. Coplic spots are seen in measles infection. Alright? So, this is a image based question. Don't forget. So, it's one single multinucleated giant cell with multiple number of nuclei. Here also same thing. This is also same thing. So, this is Warthin Finkelde giant cell seen in measles. Done. After this, now look this and tell me. Sir, here also you can see, okay, here also you can see, this is cell with the nuclei, they come. these are all the nuclei, sir. Now, these nuclei, how they are arranging? Sir, these nuclei are arranging in the shape of a horseshoe. You know the horseshoe, right? Horseshoe will be something like this, okay, horseshoe. Now, can you tell me what is this? So, these giant cells are seen in. Sir, these giant cells are called as, you know it, most of you students know it. It is seen in TB. Okay, so TB. So, what is the name of this giant cell? They are called as Langhans giant cells. Langhans giant cells. Okay, not Langer hands, Langhans giant cells. Okay, so this Langhans giant cells, Langer. Langerhans giant cells are what? Langerhans giant cells are the macrophages, are the antigen presenting cells. Okay, they are the antigen presenting cells in the skin. Okay, they are also called the histiocytes. Langerhans cell histiocytosis, there is one problem also. Okay, so now here what I am talking is, they go. Here I am showing you a, a giant cell with multiple nuclei. The nuclei are arranging in the shape of a horseshoe. So these are called as Lang Langerhans giant cells seen in TB condition. Okay, TB condition. Now, let me show you other giant cell. Now, here. So, what is this giant cell? Any idea? Now, sir, this giant cell, don't confuse with the measles. Don't confuse it with the measles. Because, why you shouldn't confuse it with the measles? I Let me tell you. Okay? First, look at the measles. Sir, here in the measles, what they will give you in a question is, see, these are the nuclei. In the nuclei, you can able to see the inclusions, there are intranuclear inclusions are seen. Okay, there are intranuclear inclusions which are seen in measles. Okay, see they go, intranuclear inclusions are seen. Okay, and not only intranuclear inclusions, but also the intracytoplasmic inclusions are seen. Okay, let me write here. In measles, okay, in this giant cells, there are intracellular plus intra not cellular, sorry, intracytoplasmic plus intranuclear inclusions. So, intracytoplasmic and intranuclear inclusions are seen. Okay, where in measles, Warthin Fingilde giant cells. These are also looking like Warthin Fingilde giant cells, but these are not Warthin Fingilde giant cells. These are foreign body giant cells. Okay, right. These are foreign body giant cells. These are 
foreign body giant cells. Now, how can we, what exactly is a foreign body giant cell? For example, because of some reason, if there is any foreign body, or if there is any foreign body left over in the body, okay, some thorn prick happened, that thorn prick, that small thorn material or some foreign bodies or some foreign body, some suture material or some dust particle, it is le left over in the tissue. Just it's left over in the tissue, sir. Now, it is going to cause the chronic inflammation in that area. Now, whenever there is chronic inflammation, macrophage, macrophages, they will fuse and forms the multinucleated giant cells. Now, this is that multinucleated giant cell which is called as a foreign body giant cell. Now, in this foreign body giant cell, there is haphazard, okay, haphazard arrangement of the nucleus, okay. So, the nucleus, this, see, these are the multiple nucleus, okay, these are the multiple nucleus which are seen in the cells, there is haphazard, okay, haphazard arrangement of nuclei. There is a hazard arrangement of the nuclei which is seen in the foreign body giant cell. Now, after this, look at this and tell me what is this giant cell? Sir, this is also a giant cell. Okay. This is also a giant cell. Look. Now, here you can clearly see this all nuclei. This all nuclei, they are present in the periphery, almost forming a circle, sir. Almost they are forming a circle. Okay. Almost they are forming a circle. Okay, so these are seen in, these are seen in, first of all tell me, what is this giant cell called as? Or what is this giant cell called as? These giant cells are called as cuton giant cells. Okay, these giant cells are called as a cuton giant cells. See, these cuton giant cells are seen in which pathology, which condition, sir? Xanthomas. Okay. Xanthomas. Xanthomas are the conditions where the lipid accumulations is going to happen. Okay. Lipid accumulations inside the cells. So, these cuton giant cells are seen in xanthomas. Now, after this, okay, after this, look here. Look at this and tell me what are these giant cells? Okay, look here and just tell me what are these giant cells. First, tell me this one. These are the owl shape. They go. Now, this is the one giant cell with owl shaped nuclei. Owl shaped nuclei, sir. Okay, owl shaped nuclei. So, these are called as Reed, Sternberg, giant cells. These are the Reed, Sternberg giant cells. Now, also called a simple RS cells. This Reed Sternberg giant cells are seen in which conditions? So they are not seen in infection, they are seen in Hodgkin's lymphoma. Okay, they are seen in Hodgkin's lymphoma. Sir. See, these are the cancers, right? Hodgkin's lymphoma is also a cancer. Okay, so chronic thing. So in Hodgkin's lymphoma, the patients are going to have this Reed Sternberg giant cells. Okay, Reed Sternberg cells. Now, here, what is this? Here also you are looking at this owl shaped thing, owl shaped nuclei. Now, what are these? So, these are not the Reed Steinberg cells. These are not the Stein Reed Steinberg cells. So in Reed Steinberg cells, you are going to see the owl shaped nuclei. Okay, owl shaped nuclei are going to be seen. Okay, it's just looking like the uh, eye of the owl. Okay, good. But these are the cells which are infected. These are the cells which are infected with cytomegalovirus. Okay, these are the cells which are infected with the CMV virus, cytomegalovirus. Okay, cytomegalovirus which is going to be commonly seen in the transplant patients when you do some transplant. Okay, transplant associated. Now, the cytomegalovirus can enter in, enters into the body. Now, how to differentiate? How to differentiate between reed Steinberg cell and cytomegalovirus? Normally, in the cytomegalovirus, okay, infections, you are going to see this cytoplasmic inclusions also. There are cytoplasmic inclusions as well as the intranuclear inclusions. This intranuclear inclusion is nothing but the virus. Okay virus, CMV virus. So, there are cytoplasmic inclusions as well as intranuclear inclusions. Both inclusions are there. But here, see, there are no inclusions. Okay, there are no inclusions, sir. Okay, so that's the one thing which I want you to know. Cytomegalovirus is also, cytomegalovirus infected cells, the cytomegalovirus infected cells will also look like the owl shape, the, the owl-eyed appearance can be seen. But these are not the reed Steinberg cells. reed Steinberg cells are the giant cells which are seen in Hodgkin's lymphoma, Hodgkin's lymphoma. Done. So, now after this, look here, the same thing, the summarized, uh, the, the summary thing, what we have seen so far. Now, look, 
here in this the nucleus are arranged in the horseshoe shape okay they are arranged in the horseshoe shape ah difference between cytomegalovirus and rishin bruck cells simply same in both the conditions they are looking almost the same right they are looking almost the same how to differentiate how to differentiate they go simple now if they gave you this image in your exam they gave you this image now it's looking like an owl it's looking like an owl owl eye okay owl eye appearance now look for the inclusions if you are able to look at this inclusions they go here you are able to see the small 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 inclusions right in the cytoplasm in the cytoplasm this inclusions are there intra cytoplasmic inclusions are there now if you see those inclusions that is not reed steinberg cell that's a cell infected with the cytomegalovirus okay so that's the one key here see there are no such inclusions present okay here there are no such inclusions present here you can clearly see the inclusions that's the one thing second way to differentiate okay if you are asked as you are asking i am telling you see here the nucleus is more of blue in color okay usually the nucleus is dark blue in color okay here it is pink in color pink so if you are seeing the pink color nucleus in the towel i then it is reed steinberg cell if you are seeing blue color nucleus then it is cell infected with the cytomegalovirus now already we have discussed okay lang hans we have discussed about the lang hans sir okay we have discussed about the lang hans dekho so in lang hans where tb lang hans tb so tb means horseshoe shaped nucleus and also we have discussed about the foreign body in foreign body what scattered dekho scattered nuclei okay scattered nucleus sir haphazard haphazard arrangement okay now in tuton in tuton which are seen as xanthomas tutons are seen as xanthomas that's why they go here you can see this white white vacuoles also xanthomas means i have explained you it's the lipid accumulation so you can see this white white color vesicles which are nothing but the lipids which are nothing but the lipids okay horseshoe horseshoe is for what horseshoe lang hans okay horseshoe nuclei lang hans here i have shown you no see dekho horseshoe lang hans seen in tb so whenever there is a tb it's a chronic infection your body cannot get rid of the get rid of that infection easily so it's a chronic inflammation that is happening in your body whenever there is a chronic inflammation the macrophages fuses the macrophages fuses and they forms which type of giant cells multinucleated giant cells so these multinucleated giant cells are having different different names in different different diseases and the structure also is going to be little different in different 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 uh, diseases here it is horseshoe shaped nuclei present Here, haphazard arrangement seen in the foreign body giant cells. Here, the round shape, absolute round shape, which is seen in the xanthomas, tuton giant cells, and reed steinberg cells, all eye shaped. Okay, so these are the things which will come in your exam for sure. Okay, for exam purpose, you have to by heart them for sure, no doubt in that. Now, after that, let's discuss about different shapes of the granulomas. Okay, now let's discuss about granulomas, sir. Okay. granulomas there are two types of granulomas okay granulomas which are seen in infectious conditions means infectious granulomas granulomas seen in infectious conditions in infectious conditions we can have the granulomas persistent infections persistent infections can lead to the chronic inflammation in chronic inflammation you can have the granulomas okay done now granulomas can also be seen in non infection states non infectious we'll discuss about that so what are the infectious granulomas and what are the non infectious granulomas we'll discuss first let me discuss with the infectious granulomas the number 1 okay the number 1 i am going to discuss now so now look here in this condition you are looking at a granuloma this is a granuloma okay so this is a granuloma sir now this granuloma any idea this granuloma It's almost having like a branched appearance, right? Branched appearance. It's almost looking like a astrocyte, or like it's looking like a star. Okay, these are called as stellate. Okay, these are called as stellate. Okay, these are called as stellate granulomas. See, these stellate granulomas are seen in which condition? Stellate granulomas are seen in which disease? Any idea, guys? 
they are seen in cat scratch disease. Cat scratch disease is because of what? It's because of the Bartonella. Okay, Bartonella, sir. It's an infection, right? It's infection, Bartonella. Okay, so Bartonella. And yeah, steroid granulomas are also seen in lympho granuloma venarium. Okay, lymphogranuloma venarium. So, this lymphogranuloma venarium in this condition, in this condition also, in lymphogranuloma venarium, infectious condition, even in this condition, you are going to have granulomas. Okay, LGV. True. Lymphogranuloma venarium because of what? Because of chlamydia. Okay, chlamydia trachomatis. Okay, chlamydia trachomatis. So the chlamydia trachomatis is the causative, uh, causative agent causing lymphogranuloma venarium and Bartonella is a causative agent causing cat scratch disease, cat scratch disease. Now, in this two conditions, cat scratch disease as well as the lymphogranuloma venarium, the patient are going to have what kind of granulomas? The steroid granuloma. Now, after steroid granuloma, look here. What is this granuloma? Any idea? Almost I have gave the clue also. What is this granuloma, which I am showing you? This is called as a ring granuloma or donut granuloma. Donut or ring granuloma. So, this donut granuloma, ring granuloma is seen in which infection? It is seen in the Q fever. So, I will be very much happy if you say what is the causative agent of the Q fever. Okay, just looking like a Q, right? Oh, if you just put, it will become Q. So, Q fever, it is because of what, which organism? Coxiella. Okay, yes. So, Coxiella. Coxiella is going to cause the Q fever. True. Okay. So, donut granuloma, ring granuloma is seen in Q fever because of the Coxiella. So, it is also an infectious granuloma. This stellate granuloma is also an example of infectious granuloma. Now, after this. Sir, here, this granuloma is actually, this is actually stained, sir. It is actually stained. This is not H&D stain. But here, this is also a granuloma. Do you know what is this? So, this is also a granuloma, sir, which is looking like a stick. I, us I usually remember it like drumstick, like, you know, so it's something like, like a drumstick, right? You know the drumstick, right? Now, I used to know, like, whenever I see a granuloma, which is like a stick, drumstick. So, drug granuloma. Okay, I used to, I, I used to remember like duck granuloma. Okay, easy pronunciation, okay? Duck granuloma. Sir? Which granuloma is going to appear like a strict drumstick? Duck granuloma. Okay, I used to remember easy way. Okay, D U R C K drusk thing like duck granuloma, simple way. Okay, so this is seen in which condition? It is seen in malaria. Yes. Okay, it's seen in the malaria, sir. cerebral malaria. Because of which organism? What is the causative agent? Plasmodium. Okay, Plasmodium falciparum. Okay, Plasmodium falciparum. Now, apart from that, what else you should know for your exam? Okay, apart from that, what else you should know for your exam is, right? Sir, in TB, let me talk about the TB, sir. Some questions which were uh, asked in the exam previously. Sir, TB persons are going to have infectious granuloma or non-infectious granuloma? Just tell me. Sir, TB infection, infectious granuloma. So, this granuloma is which type of granuloma is seen in TB infection? caseating granulomas or non caseating granulomas in TB infection? Will the central necrosis will be there or not? In case, see, TB, the patient is going to have granuloma, no doubt. It's a chronic disorder, chronic inflammatory disorder. Yes, granulomas are seen. Which type of granulomas? Caseating or non caseating in TB? The TB patients are going to have both caseating plus non caseating. Okay, the PTP patients are going to have both caseating as well as non caseating granulomas, guys. Now, after this, what else you should know? So, these are the infectious granulomas. See, important duck granuloma, donut granuloma, and steroid granuloma. Okay. Now, after this, let's write about the non infectious granulomas. Non infectious. So, what are that? 
non infectious conditions in which you can see granulomas non infectious conditions where granulomas are seen okay any idea guys can you tell me any non infectious conditions where you are going to see the granulomas non caches <coughs> sorry non infectious granulomas are seen in which conditions they are non infections they are not because of the infection okay these granulomas are not seen in the infection sir what are they can you tell me these three conditions okay sarcoidosis yes vasculitis okay vasculitis there are many many uh, vasculitis where you can have granulomas okay granulomatous vasculitis one example for you is wegner's granulomatosis okay wegner's granulomatosis wegner's granulomatosis is a granulomatous vasculitis it's a granulomatous vasculitis okay and temporal temporal arteritis okay temporal arteritis are the giant cell arteritis granulomatous vasculitis granulomas are seen it's non infectious non infectious because of the autoimmune thing okay so vasculitis and any other things rax vd yeah giant cell arteritis temporal arteritis okay giant cell arteritis temporal arteritis and even takayasu arteritis takayasu arteritis is also example of giant cell um, takayasu arteritis is example of granulomatous vasculitis there are many vasculitis which are granulomatous in nature okay inflammation is happening and you can see the granuloma formation what is granuloma you know it area of necrosis surrounded by macrophages epithelioid cells okay multinucleated giant cells and lymphocytic collar okay it's a focus it's a focus of chronic inflammation with the different different types of inflammatory cells okay mainly macrophages okay done crohn's disease Okay, Crohn's disease, which is an inflammatory bowel disease, right? Crohn's disease, inflammatory bowel disease. Crohn's is an example of granulomatous inflammation, and the other one, ulcerative colitis. Ulcerative colitis is not a, it's it's not a, it's not a, it's not a granulomatous. Okay, it's a superficial inflammation. It's not a granulomatous. Okay, so Crohn's. You know, I used to remember something like this. C, just you can make it G. Okay, C, you can simply make it G, right? So Crohn's is an example of granulomatous. Now, out of this, sarcoidosis is very important. Already you know. what is something important about the sarcoidosis sarcoidosis granulomas are called as nicked nicked granulomas so what is nicked granuloma sir lymphocytic collar absent okay okay is absent lymphocytic collar is absent okay so these are some important points which i want you to know regarding uh, the granulomas we have seen different types of granulomas okay infectious granulomas okay non infectious granulomas some image based questions and also we have seen different types of giant cells okay different types of giant cells in different different conditions okay these are the reed schindberg giant cell cmv okay the other the other is the cytomegalovirus infected cell so these are uh, teuton giant cells seen in the xanthomas here you are seeing the foreign body giant cells which are seen in foreign body like you know some foreign body infestation and these are what these are the langhan giant cells seen in tb the horseshoe shape the horseshoe shape nuclei and these are the warthin finger giant cells seen in the measles now after this after this topic this topic is completed after this topic what we have to say you need to understand chronic inflammation is happening sir. so chronic inflammation is happening what is the outcome of chronic inflammation can anyone tell me outcome this is one of the important area where you can get a question outcome of chronic inflammation okay outcome of chronic inflammation inflammation is happening 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 what are the outcomes can anyone tell me what are the outcomes of see the chronic inflammation ends as like you know, there are three phases okay there are three phases for the chronic inflammation phase number 1 is chronic inflammation completed healing and scarring okay scarring okay scarring or i can go into or i can go into amyloidosis secondary secondary amyloidosis because of this inflammation continuous inflammation chronic inflammation some proteins are going to be produced some abnormal proteins are going to be produced and they will deposit and they will cause amyloidosis okay so that's one of the fate chronic inflammation it tends as scarring secondary amyloidosis or malignancy okay even cancer even cancer for example imagine there is a person who is having chronic hepatitis imagine because of this hbv hb uh, h um, hepatitis b virus okay hbv 
patient is having chronic hepatitis. The name itself is there, they go. Chronic means chronic inflammation, itis, chronic hepatitis, chronic inflammation of the liver. Now, this chronic hepatitis, you, I hope you have shared your, in your uh, uh, liver pathology, okay? I hope you have shared your liver pathology. Just tell me, chronic hepatitis, there is a risk of liver cancer. And there is a risk of hepatocellular carcinoma, liver cancer, sir. Okay? Or in the conditions like helicobacter pylori associated gastritis. Helicobacter pylori associated gastritis. Is it an acute inflammation, one, two days thing? No, it's a chronic inflammation. Days together, days together, weeks together, months together. It's a helicobacter pylori gastritis. So, whenever there is a helicobacter pylori gastritis, now these patients, is there at risk of gastric endocarcinoma? So, what I am trying to put into your mind is, sir, how this chronic inflammation ends as? Either it ends as a good kind of thing, like, you know, simple, it's everything is repaired and healed. Okay, with the scarring. Okay, scarring is one outcome. The second outcome can be secondary amyloidosis or it can lead to cancers, malignancy. Now, here, my topic is scarring. Okay, now for your exam, what is important? So this, regarding amyloidosis, we will discuss separately. Okay, we will discuss in a very, uh, in a complete different chapter, we are going to discuss about amyloidosis. Okay, don't worry about that. Now, here in this chapter, we have to discuss about scarring, sir. Wound healing and scarring. Okay, now, let's write here. Wound healing and scarring. Scar formation. So scars are complete, like you know, the, because of the collagen deposition. Okay, right. Now, my questions to you. Okay, my questions to you. Now, wound healing is of how many types? Sir, wound healing is of how many types? Okay, wound healing occurs by how many types? Primary intention. And secondary intention. So, what is this primary intention, secondary intention? See, this intention, these are like fancy words, simple. Imagine, now you just take a surgical knife, okay? Just take a surgical knife and just make a incision over here, okay? See, this incision is going to be precise, clean cut, right? It's going to be precise, it's going to be clean cut. And this is absolutely aseptic, okay? It's a septic cut. Okay, this is not septic. There is no bacteria. There is no, like, you know, no, like, there is no, nothing dirty. Okay. It's absolutely clean. It's a clean cut. It's a aseptic cut. It's a sterile cut. Okay, it's a sterile cut, sir. Now, injury happened, sir. Injury happened. Now, this injury, it will heal, right? It will heal. So, this healing, now, the, both the edges of the skin, the both the edges of the skin, they will approximate together. Okay, the both the edges of the wound, I should say. The both the edges of the wound, they will approximate together and they will close the wound. Simple. That is called as primary intention. Okay, primary intention. Very easy, it will heal. There will be less amount of fiber deposition, less amount of granulation tissue. Everything was very smooth and well. Okay. So, first type of wound healing, it is by primary intention. Where you will see primary intention? If there is clean cut, the clean cut, which is sterile cut. Okay. So, that damage, whatever have happened, that tissue injury, whatever have happened, it's very clean cut, it is a sterile cut. Now, it will easily heal by primary intention. So, they will ask you, surgical incisions heal by, surgical incisions heal by primary intention. Now, imagine you are riding a bicycle, you are riding a bicycle and you had a fall. Okay, you had a fall. Now, you had a fall on that road. Now, whenever there is a damage here, okay, whenever there is a wound here because of the trauma, is it going to be clean, sterile cut? Definitely not. This is a dirty wound. This is a dirty wound. Now, whenever you are having some trauma, okay, with a dirty wound, now those wounds are going to heal by secondary intention. Now, there is a big damage. There is a big damage sir. It's not a clean cut. It's not a sharp cut. There is a big damage in this area. Now, you need more granulation tissue or less granulation tissue to heal this. You need more granulation tissue. You need more fibrosis. You need more collagen deposition. Okay. So, that's the question asked. So, whenever you are having an irregular cut or septic cut or a cut because of trauma. Okay. So, that's going to heal by secondary intention. Okay. Irregular cut. Okay. This is about irregular cut sir. 
Now here you need to have what more scar formation will occur. More scar formation. Okay, more scar formation is going to occur. Now my question to you. So in this wound healing process, in this wound healing process, they go. Now there is a cut over here. Okay, there is a cut over here. Now there are two edges, two edges of the wound. Now during the healing process, during the repair process, both the edges of the need to be approximated so that we can close the wound. We can close the wound. Both the edges you need to approximate. So who will do this job for you? Okay, you need to approximate both the wounds or you have to close the wound. You have to zip it. Okay. So who, which cells will do that? That's the MCQ. So wound contraction, the word they will use, uh, they, they will use is wound contraction will occur with the help of any cell. Which cells? Do you have any idea? Now, right. Wound contraction. It's with the help of myofibroblasts. Okay, so wound contraction is with the help of its cells, myofibroblasts. The name itself is there, they go myo. Myo means muscles. They, they will help in the approximation. They are just like muscles, they are helping the contraction. Okay, approximation of the wound. So myofibroblast. Why the word fibroblast? Fibroblast because more collagen deposition. These are fibroblasts are going to deposit more and more collagen so that the scar formation will occur. Okay, so now direct questions which will come in your exams. They go. Events. in wound healing. So now your wound is healing. What are the events that are seen? Okay, when your wound is healing, first in that area of the wound, do you know who is going to be produced? Granulation tissue. Granulation tissue is going to be produced in that wound. Okay, in that area. Now you will get it out, sir. What is granulation tissue? MCQs. First write, granulation tissue. So what exactly is this granulation tissue, sir? The granulation tissue is nothing but, it is nothing but, okay? These are nothing but, this is the area where there are lots and lots of, see, this is the area of wound, right? So now to this area, more and more blood vessels will come. So more and more blood vessels, along with lot of fibroblasts and inflammatory cells. Fibroblast, inflammatory cells, along with lot of blood vessels will come into this area. And now healing process begin. So this mixture is called as, this mixture is called as, Granulation tissue. So, granulation tissue means what? Blood vessels. Okay, newer blood vessels are going to come into this area to give more blood supply for the healing purpose plus fibroblast. Okay, fibroblast with inflammatory cells. Inflammatory cells. So, these are the things which are there in the granulation tissue. This fibroblast, what they will do? They will deposit more and more collagen so that now scar formation will occur. Scar is going to form. Sir. Now, what they will ask in your exam? See, first question number one. Sir, when you will see, okay, uh, something like this, granulation tissue begins on which day? Now, today I am having a wound. Today I am having a wound, right? Granulation tissue begins on which day that's the question sir granulation tissue begins on day three okay on third day first two days acute inflammation is happening granulation tissue will start to deposit means more blood vessels coming to that area more fibroblast coming to that area and the inflammatory cells okay now all this mixture is called as a granulation tissue it will start to deposit in that area from day three that's a question direct question granulation tissue begins on day three. Second one Collagen deposition, collagen deposition. Okay, the collagen fibers are starting to deposit in the area of wound, healing. Collagen deposition begins on which day? Collagen deposition. Collagen deposition begins on again day 3. Okay, now question that will come in your exam is, Sir, collagen is getting deposited for the wound, okay, to close the wound. Now, which type of collagen is this? Sir, is this which type of collagen? This is type 3 collagen. Okay, this is the type 3 collagen. So, this is your MCQ. Granulation tissue consists of which type of collagen? Okay, in the beginning, in the beginning at least, granulation tissue in the beginning, there is type 3 collagen. At the end, it will change, sir. Later, I will explain you. Now, granulation tissue 
in the beginning contains type 3 collagen. Collagen deposition begins on day 3. Now after this, maximum granulation tissue. Maximum granulation tissue. So maximum granulation tissue is seen on which day? Maximum granulation tissue formed on day 5. Okay, after 5 days, today is the day 0. Let's take today is the day 0. After 5 days, maximum amount of granulation tissue is going to be seen. These are the direct single line questions which you need to buy hard. Uh, on day 3 begins. Who begins? Collagen deposition, granulation tissue begins. Maximum granulation tissue on day 5. Which type of collagen? Type 3 collagen. Okay. Next, on day 5, there is one more event. That's maximum amount of blood vessels will come, sir. On day 5, maximum amount of blood vessels will come. That is called as maximum neovascularization. So the maximum neovascularization happens on the day 5. Okay, maximum neovascularization happens on the day 5. Now, what we are left with? They go collagen deposition begins on day 3. Okay. Now, if they ask you, maximum collagen deposition seen on happens by, okay, maximum collagen deposition is seen by 21 days. Okay. So, maximum collagen deposition occurs by 21 days, sir. 21 days. That's it. Okay. So, these are some important questions that might come in your exams. Okay. That might come in your exams. So, direct questions. Granulation tissue begins on day 3. Collagen deposition begins on day 3. Which type of collagen? Type 3 collagen. And at the end of the day, look, at the end of the day, the point which I want you to know is, see, on 21 days, we are having maximum collagen deposition. But this collagen is not type 3. Sir, this collagen, finally, it is converted into type 1. Okay. So, it is collagen type 1. So, the type 3 collagen, later it is converted into type 1 collagen. Why? Because type 1 collagen is stronger. Okay. It is a stronger collagen, which is also there in the bones, type 1. Okay. It is present in the bones also. So, the type 3 collagen, finally converted into type 1 collagen. So, these are some important direct questions which can, which can come in your exams. Now, after this, what else you should know? Sir, wound healing, see in some persons, for example, if there is a wound, in a normal healthy person, it is going to heal in, in very short amount of time. Okay, it is going to heal in a very normal, normal short amount of time. But if, if the patient is having certain deficiencies, certain mineral deficiencies, if the patient is having certain malnutrition, okay, the patient is suffering from malnutrition, then there will be delayed wound healing. Okay, delayed wound healing, sir. Right? So, now let us see, wound healing is promoted by Wound healing promoted. Promoted by which substances? Wound healing is delayed. Means it's taking a lot of time. Delayed by. So wound healing, it is promoted by ascorbic acid, that is vitamin C as well as zinc. Zinc. So vitamin C, ascorbic, ascorbic acid, and zinc, they promote the wound healing. Otherwise, for example, you know it, whenever the patient is having Vitamin C deficiency, scurvy will occur, there will be bleeding gums, bleeding gums, wound healing is not happening, there will be bleeding gums, okay, scurvy. So, vitamin C or ascorbic acid, it helps in promoting the wound healing, okay, it helps in the collagen formation, wound healing will occur, okay, zinc also. Now, it is delayed by which conditions, anyone? Simple vitamin C deficiency, vitamin C deficiency or zinc deficiency in, you know, I think uh, most of you guys already know. Imagine there is a diabetic patient. Okay, imagine there is a diabetic patient. If he is having a wound, if he got some trauma and he got some wound, now do you think this wound is going to be healed very quickly? No. No. Diabetes patients, wounds are not going to heal. Okay. So, now diabetic patients. Okay, diabetic patients, they are immunocompromised patients, right? Immunocompromised patients, their immune system is suppressed because of the hyperglycemic states. They are immunocompromised patients. So, immune system is not working properly. Wound healing is also not going to happen properly. Okay, diabetes patients and steroid users. So, even in the steroid users, wound healing is going to be delayed. Okay, steroid users also, wound healing is going to be delayed, sir. So, these are some important points which I want you to know. Wound healing is promoted by and wound healing is delayed by. Promoted by vitamin C and zinc. Wound healing is delayed in those persons who are having vitamin C deficiency, zinc deficiency and those persons who are suffering with the diabetes mellitus and steroid users. Okay, well and good. Now, let's see some important points about the scar formation. Look, let me show you the image. Look here. Now, there are 
see granulation tissue is forming okay granulation tissue is forming after this the granulation tissue will be converted into scar okay scar now look here what is happening so there is something called as hypertrophic scar and there is something called as a keloid sir these are two mcq sir image based questions very very important image based questions okay so what is a hypertrophic scar and what is a keloid let me tell you here okay there is too much scar formation too much okay there is, there is too much amount of scar tissue formation then you can either land up in hypertrophic scar or you can either land up in the keloid so what is this too much scar formation can either cause hypertrophic scar okay or keloid so what is the difference between hypertrophic scar and keloid see in hypertrophic scar okay imagine now if this is the wound okay there is excessive see imagine that's a wound sir now there is excessive amount of yes scar scar tissue there is excessive amount of scar tissue but it is not spreading beyond the margins it's not spreading beyond the margins now imagine there is a wound here now yes excessive scar tissue is formed okay excessive scar tissue is formed but in that margins only there are two margins right in between that area yes little bit extra scar tissue is formed that's it okay so see now you can clearly see here this is little bit extra scar tissue okay little bit extra scar tissue is there that's a hypertrophic scar but you look here now the scar tissue is even extending okay the scar tissue is extending the margins it's going beyond the margins okay now the scar tissue if it goes beyond the margins then it is called as a keloid so right scar extends beyond margins means the scar tissue it is the scar is forming 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 now even the scar will spread into the surrounding area okay so that's called as a keloid keloid are the big big scar tissues okay big big masses now hypertrophic scar is not like that yes excessive scar formation but limited within that margin okay now questions that can come in your exam is hypertrophic scar what is the most common uh see yeah this one is important this is the question sorry keloid so what is the most common site of the keloid the most common site of the keloid in the body is sternum okay this is the question the most common site of keloid is sternum in the sternal region and what is the treatment sir mcq what is the treatment for the keloid that's a question asked in the fmg exam 2019 okay fmg 2019 exam this question was asked so what is the treatment for the keloid there is excessive scar formation now it's looking ugly it's not looking good okay now it's looking little like you know not normal so it's looking little ugly so what do you have to do what do you have to do now it is in, intra means directly into the lesion intra lesional injection of tramsinol okay so intra lesional injection of tramsinolone intra lesional injection of tramsinolone is a treatment done for keloid hypertrophic scar doesn't need any treatment okay hypertrophic scar doesn't need any treatment it's a too much scar formation sir simple if there is too much scar formation in the body then it is going to cause either hypertrophic scar or keloid now let me tell you let me ask you one thing if there is not scar not just scar the beginning itself even before forming the scar now if there is excessive amount of granulation tissue okay let me write here too much granulation tissue now you are having this red color granulation tissue in the area of injury red color granulation tissue too much amount of granulation tissue now this too much amount of granulation tissue mcq this is called as proud flesh okay so what exactly is this proud flesh question asking the exam what exactly is a proud flesh proud flesh is too much amount of too much amount of granulation tissue is called as a proud flesh okay so with this all important topics of the chronic inflammation granulomas different types of granulomas different types of multinucleated giant cells and wound healing so all important points which are needed for your exams are done if you know this much more than enough mainly concentrate on the granulomas sir this is duct granuloma this is donut granuloma stellate granuloma okay cat scratch disease and lymphogranuloma venereum 
donut granuloma seen in Q fever. This dust granuloma, it is seen in uh, malaria, okay, cerebral malaria. And see, reed Schinberg cells seen in where? reed Schinberg cells. So, this one, sir, reed Schinberg cells are seen in Hodgkin's lymphoma. Now, what is this? Teuton giant cells seen in xanthomas. Here, Hebhazard arrangement of the nuclei seen in foreign body granuloma. See, the horseshoe shaped, horseshoe shaped nuclei seen in Langer, these are the Langer hands, giant cells. Okay. So, not granulomas. See, all this. These are the giant cells, right? Uh, Hebhazard arrangement of the nuclei, which are called as a foreign body, uh, foreign body, foreign body giant cells. These are the Teuton giant cells. Okay. Reed Schinberg giant cells. So, this is Langer hand giant cells seen in TB. And you know it, Parthen Finkel day giant cells seen in measles. Okay. Measles virus, complex part. Don't forget about this. So, with this, all the important points are completed. So, with this, the chapter of inflammation is also completed. So, cell injury and inflammation, five classes we have done. If you know this much, more than, more than, more than enough for your exams.